everybody and welcome to another episode of The Lost Art of Wrestlebox, the special collaborative uh, collaborative podcast that we have done uh, just doing basic reviews on all free lockdown content. I'm your host, Lewis Ogden, and with me this week, uh, well, for this episode, I should say, is the delivery man himself, so much so that we could probably get him a gimmick working in the new generation era, it's James Bunkle. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> How's Al doing? You all right? Yeah, yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Uh, good. You got nothing really to say, have you? Because I've, I've well, thrown you off your game, haven't I? You've thrown me off a little bit, and you know, <laughs> unlike everybody else, I'm still working, so you know, I'm, I'm kind of screwed here. <laughs> well, you, you know, you really are a true sort of like new generation talent because you're just basically doing two two things at once. I, I mean, I, I do like to think of myself as a modern day Bret Hart, but you know, it's uh, it's one of those. <laughs> you deliver. Looks like Bret Hart did in the mid nineties. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then spit my dummy out at the end. <laughs> <laughs> He's a hell of a moaner. Um, <laughs> also joining us back again for another round is the not Daz of the group, Mr. Anthony Dark. Yes, the longest reigning WrestleMania predictions champion in the history of Lost Arts. Again, it's not Daz. My best, <laughs> qu- my best quality. <laughs> my only quality. Oh, don't say yourself too short. And fucking hell, that was a bit personal. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, me. <laughs> right, cut to your next now. Come on, I want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, it's the man who's known as AXC, but we know him as Mr. Adam Cox. How are we doing? Uh, not too bad. Are you okay? I am not too bad. I'm, I was listening to these intros and I was expecting like a big build up on that. It's like a complete like shit on me from a great height, but it's all right. <laughs> well, like I always I said, have. I have respect like I said, for the editor. <laughs> like I said, she has got a cox. You have been warned. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about? Find out in this podcast. No, don't. No, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> L- move, Lewis, move on, for fuck's sake. <laughs> so, on today's episode, we are going to be looking at an event that took place about three weeks after the G1 Supercard. We are looking at the National Wrestling Alliance's Crockett Cup from 2019. Uh, before we get into the show today, um, much like we did last episode in terms of discussing uh, Ring of Honor and New Japan. Just come to you individually and sort of your um, your past past viewings in terms of your past experiences with the NWA and sort of like why we're fans of the promotion as a whole. And I'm going to go to uh, Bunkle first. Well, uh, to be honest, I-, I would say my first actual exposure to the NWA was just the title belt because uh, it was in... TNA, as I remember it, the very beginning, um, that was that was you know where I first well saw saw the belt, first got to you know the understanding of what the National Wrestling Alliance was, you know, and then you hear about obviously the the great reigns of the Ric Flairs and the Harley Races and whatnot, and did a bit of research, you know, looking back as far, and then NWA Power came along, and I thought well. I don't. I'm, I wasn't watching particularly watching wrestling at that time, and yeah, it just kind of grew from there. Um, the first episode of Power drew me in, and I've now watched everything they put up on their YouTube, mm-hmm. including finding some of the matches that aren't on their YouTube but feature that title. Mm. Yeah, but you've you've always made it known, sort of like in the chat that you know the nwa is sort of like your favorite favorite promotion and yeah you know it's it's it's, it's a darn well from from what i've watched so far it's a darn good promotion to uh to follow um anthony what are your experiences with the nwa um same as bunker wheel with the belt i've seen it in tna and the likes of jess jarrett and uh, uh christian cage doesn't the lights holding it raven um uh, ron killings are true holding it and then um 
Yeah, with the NWA power and watching how good that was. A bit sceptical at first, you know, I, I just saw it and I thought, oh, it looks a bit cheap. But as you get watching it, it's it's. I, I, I thought it was a very entertaining, uh, very wrestle-hard program that was just really enjoyable to watch and very mm. easy to watch. I didn't have to force myself to watch it. It wasn't like a chore. No, it's it's very, very good. And then learning about the history of the NWA and... Um, the prestige of that that belt, that heavyweight title. I think. Does it, am I right in saying it goes back to something like 1930? Or yeah, something like that. Yeah, 1930s. I mean, come on, you can't not respect and not not watch something like that. I mean, yeah, it's just grown on me and grown on me. And grown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think it's the pinnacle of. Uh, um, so, uh, Coxie, uh, experiences with the NWA. Uh, similar to Bunkle and not Darson away, whereas I sort of, well, I knew of it before TNA, but because I remember watching, there was a documentary with, what was the Brit wrestler called? Is it Gary, is it Gary Pierce? Don't know. I yeah, don't... There, was a, there, was a British, there was a British wrestler in like late 90s who went over to America to challenge for the NBA title. And this is like his documentary following him. I'm sure it was like Gary Pierce or something like that. Oh, yeah. I seem to remember that. I seem and, to remember uh, there being a... Yeah. <coughs> I can't remember who he, who he took on. It was a Japanese guy. It, it wasn't Yuji. It was someone else. And he lost. And I remember he had, they had a rematch or something. And it was. I think then he eventually won it and mm. held it for a bit. And But then well, like when the network first came out, I remember watching. I was watching some... Like end of way stuff on there, but they only, they only recently put the they think they put the first Crockett Cup on there from '86, but I've not seen that one. It's a uh, Gary Steele. Gary Steele, that was it. Yeah, so I watched I watched that because it was on the same the same evening as Heroes of Wrestling, <laughs> which we won't talk about. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. I wonder why. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so it went from there. Like I sort of followed it, and it's like this whole thing of like, yes, they've been acquired by Global Farty Wrestling, whatever it was called, Global Force, Force Global. I don't know the pyramid scheme. <laughs> 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 and uh, it sort of it was always that thing of like, well, Billy Corgan's bought it, right? What's he doing with it? Oh, nothing yet. And then it's all and it's all right. I'm going to do a YouTube a free YouTube show or whatever, and you're just like, oh, I'll give this a watch thing. It's on YouTube, it's free. It's less than an hour. Sometimes it's just over an hour. And then, yeah, so when it's gone from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, my real sort of like experiences with the NWA, obviously I knew that it was um, part of Jim Crockett promotions before that obviously became WCW in the early 90s. Um, that is, I'm always like seeing like little clips of uh, you know sort of like your promos from your Ric Flairs and your Dusty Rhodes is and um, you you know those those kind of sort of mainstays in terms of what you establish NWA with um, and then I, I I always remember sort of like around the time that Billy Corgan and Dixie Carter were having the whole legal battle with in terms of ownership of TNA is around about the same time that um, Billy Corgan bought the National Wrestling Alliance. Um, and it was always one of those that was floating around in the background, but never really sort of paid attention to it. And uh, it was actually you guys in the group chat uh, that sort of, you know, to brought up NWA power. Um, and I'm really glad that I took an interest in watching it because it's it's, it's the the one thing I love about NWA at the moment is that it's probably got the best system in terms of people being able to cut promos because the thing is you look at you look at mainstays in the US like WWE um, or like AEW and they don't have the they don't have the reality factor in terms of sort of like people cutting a promo. It's like whenever anybody who's on NWA, NWA power or like any kind of NWA programming and they're there cutting a promo, there's a believability to it and you can feel every single word that they're, that they're speaking. Um, that's, 
probably why I've gravitated quite towards the likes of um, Nick Aldis and Tim Storm, because their promo ability is just second to none. And uh, as I say, this, so the event we were looking at, um, this 2020 version of it was supposed to be happening sort of a couple of, a few weeks before uh, pretty much the majority of the world was put into a case of lockdown. Um, so there is, you know, you know, there is, there is a, can't find my words. <laughs> uh, you, you know, there is sort of a, a meaning behind us having a look at the show. And obviously we, uh, we get to have a look at sort of like some NWA, which I don't think is covered too much by a lot of other people. So, you know, it's an interesting, interesting promotion to, to look at. Um, so the Crockett Cup in, in question took place on April 27th, 2019 from the Car- Cabarrus Arena in Concord, North Carolina, which is just outside Charlotte. I think I remember them saying um, I couldn't find any sort of like official attendances, but I know the building is set up for about five and a half thousand people. But I don't think it was it wasn't filled up to the max, but there was like a decent crowd there. Um, commentators tonight are Joe Galley and Jim Cornette, specifically for NWA, and my old pal from Ring of Honor, Ian Riccoboni. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we we won't really talk about sort of like you know Jim Cornette and all all that sort of stuff. <laughs> oh, what's the point in this then, Soddy? <laughs> I'm, hey, I'm, I'm going to be fair as as a uh, as a Jim Cornette defender. Uh, I'm going to be honest. I Fuck think yeah, he's 100% right in about 90% of what he says. I'm, I'm just, I was going to stick that out there. Uh, you know, if you want it, if you want it, if we could do a whole night arguing backwards and forwards about Jim Cornette. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really a component for sort of like defending everything that Jim Cornette says. I think we, I think we, we said on the last podcast that just sort of there are a, a lot of things in particularly modern day wrestling where he does have a point to but then there's other moments where or there's other topics that he can just sort of like be a little bit sort of like stuck in the mud about but it's the the one thing that I always find with Jim Cornette is that no matter what he's talking about he's one of those wrestling personalities where you could like literally listen listen to him for hours yeah whether you agree with him or not he's he is charismatic in what he does. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, so we'll get on to the show. Uh, first official match is the Wildcard Tag Team Battle Royale, and the winners qualify for in the uh, the last spot for the Crockett Cup. Uh, so the teams are Will Ferreira and Rhett Titus, uh, Cam Carter and LeBron Cuso, uh, Kevin Blue and Billy Buck, Jay Bradley and Joe Cephas, uh, Zane and Dave the Dawson brothers, Royce Isaacs and Tom Latimer, and Anthony's boys, the boys. Well, come on. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I have the boys now. I'm the owner of the boys. Mm-hmm. The Dalton Castle abandoned them. They are my boys. <laughs> oh, let's fucking move on. I've gone too deep with this. <laughs> <laughs> fucking get on with it. <laughs> He's literally the cowboy and he has brought the boys onto his ranch. <laughs> Class, it's not make it sound like bloody brought back pissy mountain. <laughs> uh, Just get on with the fucking thing. All right. <laughs> Calm your tits. Um, <laughs> um, first thing I had in my notes, uh, and I forgot to mention it during the, on a rumble up G1, um, but Rep Titus is literally what Zack Sabre Jr. would look like if he ever got into bodybuilding. Like he's, don't get me wrong, he's like ripped as fuck, but he is the skinniest bodybuilder I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, I'm glad to agree with that. <laughs> um, and uh, the boys give him the Simon Dean treatment, by which I mean, um, there's a like I, I remember. I think it was like WrestleMania 22. I remember owning the DVD of it, and one of the extras was just sort of like a pre-show battle royal um, with like all the jobbers and mid-carders uh, from both brands, like basically putting the ring. And uh, Simon Dean 
was uh, on the SmackDown brand at the time. And he literally comes into the ring. And he's like, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Simon Dean. And then Snitsky comes around and boots him in the face and instantly chucks him out. It's about the same here. Like Reptitus is giving his sort of like bodybuilder poses and the boys immediately double clothesline him and uh, chuck him out. And rules that they neglect to mention before until Reptitus is eliminated is that basically um, both members of the team have to be eliminated for the team to be eliminated. Um, I mean, I, t- I didn't really make any notes for, for this match because it's your bog standard battle royale and it only goes, well, it goes less than seven minutes. Um, but the one thing that I gleaned from it was they did the exact same finish as they did at the Honor Rumble, uh, i.e. Um, both Royce Isaacs and Tom Latimer. Um, they're, they're just basically they go through the middle rope, so they're on the outside. Uh, the boys get rid of Jay Bradley and Joe Cephas, and then uh, Isaacs and Latimer immediately come in and chuck them both out. Uh, so, yeah, it was bog standards and... You know, a bit of a flat way to start the show, really. Yeah, to be fair, I, watching this, I, you know, nobody really got a crowd reaction at all. Nobody got an entrance. They were all already in the <clears> ring, and it was just a bit like, yeah, okay, they won. Mm. You know, it wasn't. There, there was no meat on the bone, so to speak. Yeah. For me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anthony, thoughts? Um. It's difficult. I, th- I think it's very harsh because there's a lot of good... T- well, Dawson's are a good team. My boys are a good team. <laughs> Obviously, the Roy- uh, um, Isaacs and Latimer are a good team. I think there's there's three teams there that we, they could have easily done like a, a, a triple threat tag team match. I think there was more... I think, I think it was just a bit, sometimes a bit more cannon fodder than anything else. Um... Mm. Maybe a bit unnecessary. It, it, it is what it is. It wasn't bad by any stretch of the means, but I just felt it could have been better. Yeah. If you know what I mean. It didn't need to be a battle royale, I don't think. But no, no, That's, I'd, I'd agree with that definitely. Uh, Coxie thoughts? Uh, yeah, like bunkers. There was no entrances or anything. It's like everyone's in the ring. Uh, I, I didn't find this match very enjoyable. Like the only things I really picked up on was like one team, I think it was Isaacs and Latimer either got thrown or they climbed out or whatever. And it was, I think it was Cornette was like, oh, they've been thrown. Or one of the other commentators like, yeah, they've been thrown out. It's like, no, I think they went and the Cornette chimes in with, yeah, I, went for the, I think they went for the middle rope. So they haven't technically been eliminated. So then it's, of course, they came in uh, mm. and, and won it. But it's an interesting note I found here online. Which uh, which mentions Joseph has got his head had his head shaved by David Arquette back in January mm. for this show. Yeah. Uh, also, it wasn't a very long, in terms of like a, a tag team battle royal. It only ran six minutes forty. Mm. Yeah. So. And to be honest, not not really. There wasn't a lot that particularly happened. Um, and I was quite interested, sort of like I, I I found out during this match that this was like both. Tom Latimer and Royce Isaacs, they were both singles competitors and just basically thrown together as a tag team, which sort of like you you look forward where we are in terms of, um, you know, early June of 2020 and all that they've done for sort of in sort of like NWA power. It's it's interesting that this is the show where they were sort of like thrown together. Yeah, I, I I quite like that because you know it, as as soon as they said it's the wild card battle royal and then they won, it was like it, it kind of it tied it into power nowadays. You know they are called the wild card. It's like okay, so this is how it all began. It's almost mm-hmm. like you're getting that beginning of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I, I suppose that was the best thing to take from the you know to take from the match itself. I'd say there wasn't there wasn't too much. You know, other than people being eliminated, there wasn't actually too much goings on, so to speak. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. It, like Bunkle said, it wasn't like the battle, uh, the, the battle of well, the the battle royale and the G1 Supercard. There was lots happening. There was so, there was sort of like semi storylines going on in between it as well that he could sort of uh, read into and get into, and that could 
go along and it'll make you hyped up for one person or hyped up for <clears throat> two people standing in the ring and they'll give you that moment where there's two opposite each other and then they'll sort of like uh, the camera will back away and re- the crowd getting all hyped. It was just a bit bleh. Uh, and I remember being at a, a certain wrestling event with a certain company with Ring of Honor and we it was there was an afternoon show and an evening show and I remember us lot ribbing um a Mr. Roderick Strong for his uh, boots. Mm-hmm. I believe some of the chants were nice belt shit boots. Nice belt <laughs> shit boots. Nice belt shit boots. Nice belt shit boots. To which he happily turned around and, and I think we tried to for some reason I don't know if we were just drunk or bad evening session we were going, Nice belt, nice boots. Nice spells night. We've just got to change the tone. So what the hell has Royce Isaac got on his feet? <laughs> I'm no, I, I am slowly turned into Dalton Castle. I'm, I'm realizing this now. <laughs> I, to, to fair, <laughs> I, I did wonder myself, and it's like, has he, has he been stealing from Tatonka and like stolen some moccasins or something? Like I thought he raided Dolly Parton's place. I mean, what the hell is that? <laughs> hey. Yeah, that's, I, I can't say that I noticed, to be honest. But, you know, that's just me. Uh, so, Caprice Coleman is up on the staging area, um, shows us the brackets on the big screen, and informs us that the winners will not only win the Crockett Cup, but will also be crowned the new NWA Tag Team Champions. Um, cut to uh, footage of Flip Gordon. Um, footage oh, just, of... Just before you cut to Flip Gordon... You need to also mention Caprice Coleman boxes here by announcing the final entrance into the tournament as Thomas and Lattimore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, see, I, I think I remember. I think I remember him saying, but I've, I've not made a note of it. So <laughs> that's probably why I've forgotten. <laughs> to be fair, I just wondered how this guy had a job. I'll be honest. What did he actually bring? What did he do? Why was uh, he there? Uh, no, you see, there's a bit later on, sort of like with. An NWA legend that sort of made me laugh a little bit. Just get Cornette to do it. No, oh, right, okay. I think you're going a bit too far with this Cornette thing now, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Just fucking calm down. Christ. You want to talk we'll about get... NWA legends? Jim Cornette we'll get... is one. We'll get yeah, for all the wrong reasons, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll... we'll get to Cornette later on. Um, so, yeah, the cut to footage of Flip Gordon, the last time he wrestled in the uh, Cabarrus Arena. Uh, he tore his MCL in a match with Tracy Williams on uh, Ring of Honor TV back in January. Um, yeah, that was just basically the sole purpose of this this footage. Just, you know, last time he was here, he injured his knee quite severely. So, you know, will he go down exactly the same road? We're about to find out. Um so match number two is the first of four quarterfinal matches in the Crockett Cup tournament. Uh, first team rep- rep- representing CMLL is Stuka Jr. and Guerrero Maya Jr. And they're taking on the Ring of Honor team of Flip Gordon and Bandido. Um, st- yeah, not really know much about the CMLL team. Uh, I, the only thing that I could really find was Stuka Jr. Uh, he had... A um, he's known for having a symbol that was used predominantly by the um, German army, army, navy, and the air force in uh, the majority of the Second World War. Read into that what you will. Oh, okay. <laughs> lovely! <laughs> yeah. Jesus, it's not the Nazi symbol. I'll tell you that much. But it's the um, you know the uh, black sort of cross with sort of like the white outline to it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's that symbol. Can't tell you why. He just did. Uh, okay, great. great. <laughs> <laughs> I got. I'm gonna pick my logo. What am I gonna choose? Oh, I could just choose like it. So I'll just type something on Google Images. What's this? The Iron Cross. Oh, let's pick that. There we are. That doesn't. <laughs> who used it before? Oh, all right. Okay then. <laughs> but who remembers that? <laughs> Could be now. worse. It could have incorporated the Hitler tash and his uh, his luchador mask. Oh, that would have been really oh, yeah. taken. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm not. I was just going to say L Hitler then, but that's not. 
Cornette would have marked out. Oh. He could have got away with it. He could have Corn, just said Corn, it. Was... Cornette would be his fucking manager. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? You're a bit harsh, you. <laughs> oh, I'm not in bed with him like you. <laughs> <laughs> look, just because I want... Just because I want wrestling to actually tell a story and not look ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> well, he certainly tells a story. <laughs> so anyway, oh. the match, the match, the match um, <laughs> sort of kicks off, kicks off in sort of like your your bog standard, you know, um, back and forth uh, offensive. Um, Guerrero Meyer Jr. hits a succession of tilt world backbreakers after there's quite an awkward miscommunication between um flip and bandido uh this, the like i think it was like bandido held Graham, Graham Meyer jr and then uh flip accidentally hit him with a super kick and then they were just sort of like stood around looking at each other before they obviously just called an audible and just went into the the back breaker's spot um bandido gets lovely height when taking two monkey flips um from stuka jr uh, there's a really nice uh, double surfboard spot from the CMLL team uh, as Flip tries to pin them during it, which was a really quite nice spot. Um, Stuka with a lovely tornado, uh, torpedo fake-out dive uh, onto Bandido on the outside. Uh, I've just had in my notes that up until this point, it was all Stuka and uh, Guerrero Maya. Um, nice combination as um, Flip monkey flips, well, I should say, Flip Gordon monkey flips Bandido into a head scissors on Stuka. Um, flip with a lovely skin the cat and springboard into a second rope moonsault. Uh, there was a bit of a blown code red spot from Bandido. Uh, Stuka uh, tries a power driver, um, but reverses Bandido's reversal into a destroyer. Now, I'm not really a great big massive fan of the Canadian destroyer. Like, it's up there with sort of like one of the of like overused moves including sort of like the Spanish fly and the super kick but this was done like this destroyer spot was done in quite a way that I liked in sort of they were both jockeying for positions um and just stuck a using his momentum to just nail the I, I think they'd called it a Mexican destroyer or something like that um Guerrero Maya Jr's got a very um, nasty looking finisher in, I in love a good this way. Finisher. I love this finisher. Yeah, it's a, it's a like a double underhook um, suplex in sort of like a brain buster onto the knee, sort of like what Adam Cole does. Looks really fucking good. Um, has anybody got anything else before I go to the finish? Uh, um, apparently, from what I've read up on briefly, uh, both Guerrero Maya and Stucker Jr. have had sporadic appearances in Ring of Honor. Right, okay. Uh, and Guerrero Jr.'s finisher is called the Mayan Sacrifice. Mm. So there you go. <laughs> um, I, I, I'll get my points out of the way at the finish, because everybody's <laughs> going to shit on me anyway. All right, okay. <laughs> I, um, I just want to say, I just want to say, I, I love Bandido, massive, massive fan of him. I think mm. he can do it all, he can do your flippy stuff, but he's strong as well, and I think he, 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 he can do it all. He can do it all. He's one of them wrestlers who can just do it all, mm-hmm. and uh, he's he does save the uh, the the monkey flip. I think it was Stucker Junior and Bandido saves just by simply carrying him and picking him up and just please flip me sort of thing. It was yeah. really good to see. No, I think he's I think he's brilliant. Yeah, I'm a I'm a really, I'm a advocate of Bandido. I think he's really good as well. Um, so the finish is actually like quite a nice. Uh, tag team combination um bandido uses sort of like a slingshot suplex to then put flip um to put stucker on uh flip shoulders and then he immediately hits the tk which he calls the spot star spangled banner uh and ring of honor team pick up the victory in 12 minutes 30 uh it was quite sloppy at times i must say like it wasn't a clean cut like mm absolutely perfect match but I thought it was still a rather enjoyable encounter um, I guess it's my turn uh, I absolutely hated this match oh. um, <laughs> okay. I, I, I decided throughout this pay-per-view that I was going to count the number of dives in each match there were 12 
in this. I had no idea who was supposed to be face. I had no idea who was supposed to be heel. And I'm, it was supposed to be a tag team match, yet nobody tagged anyone. It was just a complete schmoz. <laughs> and Shots. yeah, I, honestly, like, where was what was the what was the story being told? It was the What's Cockney the Cup. It's a to- it's a tag team tournament. There's tag team. Be, it's a tag. tag it's other. a tag team tournament. Tag each other need to be in a story. tag match. It's the Cockney Cup for fuck's sake. There doesn't need to, to be a storyline. There doesn't need to be a storyline. The storyline is the Cockney Cup. No, it, that is it. That's it. Every every other match on this card tries to tell a story. This match did nothing. It was flips for the sake of flipping. No heels, no faces. Does it need to be a heel or a face? Yes, they do. No, it's, it's a cocking cup, for fuck's sake. That's the storyline. That's the there story. Needs to be a, this, seriously. <laughs> it's a tag team tournament. So, what, you're not supposed to tag each other? Well, are you, so, are you telling me that? They, they probably went under, like, Mexican tag rules, given that, like, three of them you know, are Mexican. You, you're not told that though. Well, and yeah, then, I'm not trying ne- to. In the next, in the next match, I'm not trying to. Def- and Gordon, they actually tag each other. I'm not trying to defend it. I'm just, I'm just saying that's the way that they do tag <laughs> matches in Mexico. Well, Mexican wrestling can go fuck itself. I <laughs> <don't> <laughs> well, <laughs> imagine that coming from the Jesus. Oh, next support. It's not for me. Imagine that coming from the Jesus. <laughs> I'm no longer <laughs> watching it. <laughs> well, Could the Cornet symbiotes <laughs> take it over. Yeah. <laughs> Oi, 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 hey, this is just, that's just fucking Eddie Bunk, for fuck's sake. God knows what's going next. <laughs> what? <laughs> I can, on a serious note, on a serious note, I can understand why you don't like it. Yeah. Because it was very, very messy. And although I do like dive spots, I felt it was a bit, I, I felt the, these four could do more in the ring rather than piss farting around trying to set up spots. Well, PCO's fucked then. PCO's <laughs> fucked for the last, what, 40 years? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, to, yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure we got the, the opinions of the other two. Uh, Coxie, thoughts on this one? <laughs> I'm I'm kind of inclined to agree with Bunk on the way that like I'm I'm not overly a fan of flips. Like, I'm I'm all for a flip if it's, if it's warranted. But if it's literally... A flip for the sake of a flip, then no, get the fuck. But mm. there's that thing is you've got you've got Bandido and Flip Gordon who are both like light guys plus Bandido. You know, I assume, believe he's Mexican. Yeah, yeah, he's Mexican. And then you've got the two other guys from CMLL, which is all just lucha anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember Jericho made mention recently. Uh, well, I say recently, probably about a month ago to the Lucha Brothers in AEW where they weren't making tags. They were literally mm-hmm. just in and out, in and out, and he said so you need to go back and learn American tag wrestling sort of thing or something. Because it just looks daft if you just sort of jump in and out and then there's no story, there's no, not story, but there's no uh, like continuity. psychology to it. Yeah, so kind of continuous psychology to it sort of thing like, right, you've just gone out of the ring so he's jumped in. Like, but um. Yeah, it was a decent match, I thought, in terms of like the stuff like what they did, like the, the, the TKO at the end I was like sort of sort of pricked my ears up and sort of was like, Oh shit, that's good. Mm. Um but also in a side note, this was the second longest match on the card at twelve minutes thirty. Mm-hmm. So but yeah, um there was better matches on the card I think later on. Yeah, but, I'd say so. Uh, so we get the first of three little uh, promo snippets um, about on the uh, on the main event. Um, most notably, it centers around sort of like the relationship between Mike Skull and Nick Aldis, uh, and it also has Mike Skull like burying British boot camp and TNA in the same process. <laughs> Just basically him going, yeah, I went on this uh, went on this program uh, British boot camp, and it did next to nothing for my career. It's like yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I remember this. Uh, he's like, yeah, uh, Nick Nick put in a good world for me. Like, he put his neck on the line for me. And I went there, and they did nothing for me. <laughs> oh. Shock. <laughs> That's TNA down to a T. 
so we have match number three, which is the second quarter final in the Crockett Cup. It's the wild card team of Tom Latimer and Royce Isaacs, and they are taking on the War Kings, uh, the team of Jack Stain and Crimson. Oh my God, Crimson, the undefeated man from TNA. Uh, to which Ian Riccoboni kills all credibility with him when he calls him a household name. <laughs> which houses is he referring to? <laughs> TNA. <laughs> you know, because right. he's, he's faced the likes of Nick Aldis and Matt Morgan and, you know, Samoa Joe, which don't put Matt Morgan in the same in the same bracket as Aldis and Joe for fuck's sake. Remember the, uh, the, 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 the gimmick Matt Morgan had? Now, I don't know if it was true or not, almost certainly bleeding wasn't, that he had his DNA sent to space. Well, he was the blueprint, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was that was the gimmick, wasn't it? Yeah. What the <laughs> feck was that all about? I swear to God. <laughs> he's he's watching, it's going to go absolute ape shit for you, bro. <laughs> bro, I swear to God. <laughs> we'll call you the blueprint. We'll put you over, bro. <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, actually amazed that he <laughs> uh, recently didn't come up with something like L Hitler. But <laughs> 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 Vince, if you're listening, it's all yours, pal. Well, there is that there is that age old um, story. I think like um, Bob Holly mentioned it mentions it in his book, how Vince Russo wants to call the Falcon Arrow the Holocaust. <gasps> yes, I heard this. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Which you know, <laughs> Vince Russo fans defend that. <laughs> and to be honest, while we're on the subject of Vince Russo, I'm not one for sort of like you know sticking up for Jim Cornette that much. But whenever he sort of like buries Vince Russo, it's just it's listening gold, really. I love it when they get considered. Like particularly with the the um the brawl for all dark side of the ring episode, um like although sort of like you know we have Jim Cornette just like going I want to kill this motherfucker, um <laughs> it's like um Vince Russo on a whole like did not come across good, did did not come across well in that episode. I'll just say that much, um. I didn't make too many notes for this match. Um, the, the only sort of bit of wrestling I had for this was uh, there was a nice deadlift suplex from the ground from Royce Isaacs to Crimson. Um, and then Ian Riccoboni sort of like flirts with danger when talking about Latimer not getting along with uh, his previous tag team partners. And I was just sort of careful now, careful now, <laughs> careful now. <laughs> Down with that sort of thing. Careful now. <laughs> um. Is, do any of you guys have anything on this match before I go to the finish? Because, as I say, I didn't really make too many notes about it. Um, I, I, I would like to point out that the, the story being told in the match was the heels working on Crimson so that he could make the hot tag to the bigger man. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> story. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I asked for. <laughs> Clear reasoning. Go fuck yourself. Anyway, what I <laughs> is... No, I, 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 I like the look of the, the walking walkings um Crimson and Jack Stain, I think they were. weren't they accompanied to the ring by Road Warrior Animal? They were uh, NWA seventieth anniversary? Yes. Yes. Which yeah. is how they qualified for the, the uh the Crockett Company itself. Disappointed not to see um the Road Warrior um, leading him tonight. I thought he would be, as a former winner of the damn thing, you'd... Uh, the first winner, yeah. Yeah, you'd expect him to, to be there, but... Uh, ah, well. Um, there's a bit where Dane carries both um, Isaacs and Latimer. I thought yeah, that, was pretty, nice. that was pretty impressive. Mm. It was a really uh, enhanced the storyline. <laughs> <laughs> what? The, it was the hot tag spot. No, no, I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. No, I'm just agreeing with you now. Um, so, yeah, the finish comes um, where Isaac uh, rolls up Dane with his feet on the ropes after uh, Tom Latimer had um, wrapped Crimson's leg around the ring post a couple of times. 
uh, and the wild card team win in seven minutes fifty. Uh, it's, it's, this was fine. I mean, it was nothing really special, but nothing awful at the same time. I mean, it was just there for me. Uh, um, to be fair, I'm inclined to agree. It was the, I think the the idea of it is was supposed to be building the wild card as you know the 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 heels who will do anything to win, but they're looking for quick wins. You know, the, I mean, you talk about the actual wrestling moves that happened in the match. Other than punching and kicking, they weren't right a lot. But mm. I think I almost feel like that was the point. <laughs> You know, and it made what Jack Jack Dane did when he came in all the more impressive. Um, you know, I would have I would have preferred to see the Walkings go on and do a bit more. I think they have, you know, they have the look. They have, to me, you know, they look like a really good powerhouse tag team. And you know, I w- I would have preferred to see them, you know maybe wrestle somebody else in the first round so we could get a bit more of them on the show. Um, but that, you know, that's it for me, really. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I just really love the storyline in this and I think it's really... <laughs> no, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. <laughs> um, I, 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 I like both teams. I do think it was a bit of a... Oh. The problem is, I think these two teams should have gone further in the tournament. Um, I, 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 I really like the look of the Walkings. I really like the look of them. The two absolutely big, hard-hitting, smash-mouth blokes. But saying that, so Isaacs and Latimer. And I can't help but thinking maybe if that was the final, they could have gone that bit longer and, and given a better quality of, of 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 match which let's be honest let's these these four blokes could possibly give us a better match than what they put forward on the on this night hmm uh coxie thoughts uh yeah um i was surprised to be if anything that isaacs and latimer or sorry Tom, thomas and latimer were on the so early like after they just won the battle royal and they're like the literally this is like the first round match and then they're straight back in it. Mm. Um, but sort of watching them, even though they've not been together that long, it was there was it seemed like there was more chemistry between them two than there was the Walkings to a degree for me. Mm. Uh, again, it wasn't very long, but then it's, it didn't really need to be because the end. But like it's one of them. I sort of thinking if I. Did have, if I hadn't seen this before, I would sort of like Isaacs and Latimer would be my picks now to be like, right, they're gonna go on and win it. Mm. So, uh, so we'll get on to uh, the next match, match number four. Uh, it's Mark and Jay, the Briscoe brothers, against uh, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibbs and the Rock and Roll Express. Um, there's a pre- pre-taped vignette uh, with the Briscoes. Um, I don't personally. Well, I, I don't really personally like the Briscoes because they're, they're of that, you know, they're in that part of America that have certain aspects of life that I don't really agree with them. But I thought this was a really good promo, especially from Jay Briscoe. I thought he was he was very he was, he was very confident in terms of sort of like cutting a promo, and I can sort of see why he is a former Ring of Other World champion. Because I, I thought he was really good here. Yeah, I really enjoyed this promo. To be fair, I thought it uh, um, it made them come across really, really menacing. Uh, you know, especially given who their opponents are. Um. So yeah, uh, <laughs> Bunkle's boy Jim Cornette. Uh, he's in the ring and he introduces the Rock and Roll Express, and um, uh, it's mainly Ricky Morton who cuts a promo. Uh, it's interesting to note that Ricky Morton mentions about the Rock and Roll Express being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, even though they've never wrestled there, which is a complete lie. Um, they, had, <laughs> they had spells of uh, wrestling in the WWE in 1993 as part of the Smoky Mountain Connection, uh, and then they were part of the NWA invasion in uh, early 1998. Um, so, yeah, they, they have wrestled the WWE before. I will always say Ricky Morton um, believes, well, was probably like 61 years old at the time. 
still able to do a fucking hurricane runner. Guaranteed. <laughs> granted, he did nearly land on his head, but you know, fair <laughs> enough. He was able to hit it. Um, the uh, first instance on this pay per view with somebody getting color. Uh, Ricky Morton gets busted open after um, multiple shots into the ring post. Um, in which we get black and white screen every time we uh, sort of get a close up. Uh, I, d- I didn't really mind sort of like you know the the, the cut into black and white every now and then because I think like if it if it were done with WWE the amount of camera cuts that they fucking do it would just be d- migraine inducing. But I, I felt like I understand why they did it because you know it's being broadcast on YouTube and they want to keep it somewhat clean to an extent um it might just be me did were you guys bothered about this this uh cut to black and white every now and then it was very distracting yeah i, I, I did find it distracting um but I, I find it distracting in that i, I suppose i wasn't ex- i just wasn't expecting it I, you know i thought oh well it's youtube you can post to an extent whatever you wish but um you know it's once I got used to it, you know, it, it didn't bother me. See, I think I watched a different version because I sort of acquired it via means. Ah, and so I uh, guess it was either, it was shown somewhere else first, so there wasn't any cuts of black and white. So whether that's like a new thing they've done for YouTube because of the new rules coming in about you have to declare your content safe for children or aim more towards adults or whatever, I don't know. But could also, yeah. could also be a monetization thing, to be fair. So. I would I'd probably say that this was maybe a YouTube thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's Jim Cornette on commentary. Like, God bless him. This is probably the most, like, passionate he sounds um, on commentary all night. He's just trying to put in sort of, like, the rock and roll reputation in terms of sort of, like, getting heat from the crowd. But surprisingly, this crowd was quite quiet for this match, which is surprising given that the Rock and Roll Express were involved in it. I think it's more the, to me, that seemed to come across more as the style of the match, just because, you know, rock and roll did get a big pop when they came out, and the crowd did seem hot for them, but they got absolutely murdered. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> you know, um, the, this I, this wasn't a nice, I wouldn't say this was a nice, you know, back and forth tag match. This was, yeah, no, they're getting killed. Yeah, it's, it's just mainly Richard Morton getting his head yeah, but it's the it's a standard rock and roll express match, isn't it, really? Yeah. As they call it, playing Ricky Morton. Ricky Morton gets worked over, gets the hot tag to Robert Gibson, and then works towards the comeback. So. Well, speaking of the uh, rock and roll comeback, um, it uh, pretty much ends up with the uh, rocket launcher, um, which is very slightly botched as um, Ricky Morton is just like literally on the top rope for fucking ages and he has to wait for Robert Gibson to get over. Uh, I will credit Jim Cornette because he sort of um, covered for it by just sort of like going, um, well, he's, uh, he can't really see. He's sort of like he's lost a, a lot of amount of blood. He's probably just trying to keep himself balanced on the top rope. So, you know, nice, nice cover from uh, from Cornette. Um and then pretty much the finish, uh, Death Valley Driver from Jay Briscoe, Froggy Elbow from Mark, and the Briscoes pin Ricky Morton and uh, advance in the tournament in 6 minutes 55. I didn't know what to think of this match. Uh, as I say, like, it's Bunkle sort of like going on about like um, it was just mainly Briscoes, a very, very short comeback from um, Rock and Roll, and then the Briscoes just sort of hit the finish and won. So, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. To, uh, what do you guys think of this? Uh, honestly, I quite liked it. Uh, I probably shouldn't, but, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I did. You know, the it was still a proper tag team match with tags. There was still, you know, it was still a story being told, you know, and it was the right story. The worst thing they could have done here was have the rock and roll go over like honestly you know if, if even if it was like some screwy roll up or something after the promo that the briscoes did you know um they showed us what the briscoes did before the match there was only one outcome that made sense and that was the briscoes completely murdering them and that's what happened so mm. you know I, I i kind of enjoyed it <laughs> yeah. 
in, this, in, in probably a sadistic way. Fair enough. <laughs> He just likes seeing old people get beaten up. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I tell you, but Bunkle's favourite match is New Jack with his Gypsy Joe. <laughs> That's not <Dude>. true. <laughs> right. We've learnt a lot about Bunkle already. Anyway, right. Um, no, I did. I, I, I got what I expected from this match. I mean, it's, it's the rock and roll at best. These are six-year-old guys. They're not gonna, <laughs> you know what I mean. They're not gonna go very far, and it's not like they're going to um, uh, keep up with the likes of the Briscoes, who are, are much younger and 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 just I don't want to say better, but you know what I mean. But you know they what are. I mean. They, 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 <laughs> but yeah, they, I, they I just thought of it. Would I? <laughs> They have more longevity in sort of like going forward in the tournament yeah. than you would say rock and roll did. Yeah, and I didn't expect. I, I got what I expected out of this. It wasn't great, but it wasn't sad and depressing. Mm. Uh, Coxie. Uh, yeah, it was. For a start, it only went. It went less than seven minutes. Like, but it was. I think that's all you need if it's, especially if it's like as, as one sided as it was with like the Briscoes, which is like just dominating on Rock and Roll Express. Um. If I was booking it, I'd have probably had that the Rock and Roll Express go over, but then just get beaten to literal death. <laughs> literal by, death. <laughs> not, <laughs> well, bring out the coffins, lads. Here we go. <laughs> bring out your dad. <laughs> not bring literally. out your dad. Bring out your dad. <laughs> well, He's like, not dead. I'd, uh, <laughs> I'd I'd have them like it'd be like like if. Uh, What's it? Mark hits the the froggy elbow on on Ricky, and then like Ricky somehow gets a, a small package or something, then they get beaten, so they can't. Then they say, "Oh, they they can't continue." So it's gonna be a buy into the next round or whatever. Yeah. Um, Briscoes possibly make it to the final, and then Rock and Roll Express fuck them over at the end or something. Mm-hmm. Like that's how I probably would have done it, but. Yeah, again, it probably just is putting down to age, but I'm I'm kind of surprised in a way that they didn't put the Rock and Roll Express over for this one, considering it's a like Carolina crowd. So yeah. Well, I, I just want to go on from that point that they didn't put them over. Um, as we were building towards the uh, the profit of the 2020 a few well, months ago now, um, they were they, they were going on and on and on about how the Rock and Roll Express haven't made it past the first round. And they're going on and on and on about that. Now, I don't know about you, but do you not think they took this defeat as a way to build up to this event to have them possibly win it this time? And maybe that's their send off? Well, do you think? I'm inclined to agree because they, they did win, they won the titles on power to become nine time champions, I believe it is. Mm. So win the Crockett Cup and the titles in 2020. First time they win the Crockett Cup. Ten time champions off into the sunset. It it kind of writes itself, doesn't it? Yeah. Plus, given what happens in sort of like the main event and what was scheduled to be in the main event in this year's Crockett Cup, um, it wouldn't really surprise me if that's possibly the way that they were going in terms yeah. of sort of like a, a year long build. At least I think, anyway. It'll be, uh, a, it'll be a big, big payoff, especially for a tag team yeah. like the Rock and Roll Express. And I think um, if they did win it this year, if it happens this year, which I honestly think it will, um, if it does happen this year, it'll be worth it for us as wrestling fans to see them win it now. And then off they go and retire and say, right, we've done it all now. We don't need to do any more. And just have that legacy, that very nice, that nice legacy, that nice send off for them. Because I think they deserve it. I really do think they deserve that. Yeah. 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 The, there's a, you know, there's a reason why, you know, they are, you know, still an active team, so to speak, you know, and, I think it, it, you know, especially, you know, under the NWA banner, you do it in Charlotte or wherever, it's just, it is going to be a massive pop. It's going to be that that payoff that you're talking about. And, and I mean, I love builds that are like a year long because you can do so much in that time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like, if we're thinking of sort of like one year builds, like the, the one thing... The one um, 
rivalry you can think of is um, Randy Savage and Paul Hogan from WrestleMania 4 to WrestleMania 5, and that is held in regards as being one of the best year-long built feuds in the history of wrestling. So it's it is like literally one of those of if you do it right, you've got plenty of time to do X amount of whatever you want to do. As long as the content is there and you're advancing the story along, you're literally coming up roses. Uh, so match number five is um, PCO and Brody King representing Ring of Honor and Villain Enterprises against the New Japan team of Sat- Satoshi Kojima and Yuji Nagata. Um, Kojima and Nagata, both former IWGP World Heavyweight Champions. Um, unfortunately, it's not really that well known because it's around about the same time that New Japan were doing their best um, new generation impression. Uh, it was around about the time their title reigns um, when business was pretty much on its arse in terms of sort of like New Japan. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got to be honest. I didn't really, I didn't really like this match. I felt that it dragged on far too long for whatever reason. Like I just really wasn't into it. Um, I've got to say. Brody King, Jesus Christ, he he's an, looks an absolute fucking knacker. Like, literally, he's covered from head to toe in, like, all sorts of tattoos. And then he's got, like, a black colour scheme with leopard print, like, mm. incorporated with him. I just, it looked fucking woeful. It really, really did. <laughs> Um, so yeah, like literally, bar the finish, I've got absolutely nothing for this match because I was I was zoning out for this for this one. I'm afraid. Um, it's, um, have you guys got anything in particular? To be fair, all I've put is nice back and forth, all four men, hard hitting, no frills. Um, you know, I I thought it I thought it was solid, if not spectacular. Hmm. I, I, I actually have quite a bit on this. Uh, first of all, Nagata, I think it's the, uh, usually Nagata's shirt, and he pulls it over his head, and it's got his face on the underside of his <laughs> yeah. shirt. I thought yeah. that was bloody brilliant. Also, <laughs> it was very, very slow and very sluggish. It was like what, like watching four fat bridesmaids dancing at a wedding, like shifting fucking, <laughs> it's like shifting fucking wardrobes, really, wasn't it? It was, it was a bit, oh. And, uh, and then they kept going on about PCO not hu- be, not being human, and I must have heard that for about f- about five million times in this match. It it, it wore its welcome like very yeah. quickly. And like, Brody, a, yeah, go on. It's just, it's a shame with sort of Yuji Nagata because like um, the same show that I went to see when I saw Okada Zack Saber and uh, Ishii and Suzuki, he had a match with he had like a really good uh, veteran v rookie match with. Uh, young line Shoto Amino, and it was it didn't go too long, but it was like a very nice sort of veteran versus rookie match. And then I'm pretty sure it was like earlier in this year during that year's New Japan Cup, um, him and Ishii just had like a really good like hard hitting match. Um, but as I say, it was just a shame because like th- this match went 11 minutes 50. Um, and as I say, for me, it just it dragged. It felt a lot longer, and yeah, I was yeah. I end, I just ended up being like disappointed with it. I really, really yeah. did. Yeah, to be fair, I think he was uh, Nagata was the only one that I came out of it thinking actually he was he was quite good. Mm. Yeah, his, his partner, uh, I don't think he did a right lot, and they the, they did one of the spots that I really don't like, which is in the corner with the chops. Mm. And it's yeah. And I don't and I don't mind when you when you do it a little bit, but then when they become these tiny little taps, yeah, it, it's just it, defe- it defeats yeah. defeats the purpose. It does exactly. It defeats the purpose, and yeah, that just kind of yeah, I, the match kind of felt like that move. Really, mm-hmm. you know, it just it was slow. It was just yeah, not 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 enough going on for how yeah. long it was. PCO did his standard suicide dive, which I thought was uh, what fa- what I found really funny was yeah, there was a bit where he's in the ring on his own, he turns and looks outside to see all three men line up. Yeah. He then starts jumping around like some excited toddler <laughs> before 
You see, he just starts <laughs> bout, like jumping up and down, like bouncing like a three-year-old on Christmas morning. <laughs> and then does it, and I thought that was really. But the, the commentators did the, 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 the what I call the football commentator thing, where they talk about anything and everything that isn't the match. They talk yeah. about mm. the outside. They were talking about uh, what what PCO would used to do. What Brody King, Brody King was in a band, and what Nagata and Kojima do outside. It was they, they weren't commentating on the match. They were talking about things that did matter but weren't needed for this if you yeah. know what i mean did it did it, 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 it was unnecessary it was just a bit unnecessary mm-hmm. um so yeah this finish literally comes uh brody king hits kojima with a cradle shock and uh they win the match to advance in 11 minutes 50 uh we'll just wait until coxie gets back just to get I'm his here. thoughts on this oh are you here are you um, yeah, we literally just got to the end of um, the PCO Brody King and Satoshi Kojima Yuji Nagata match. Um, we didn't really, <laughs> we didn't really have too much to say. Uh, what did you think of it? Uh, I, I was, I sort of enjoyed this match to be fair. Okay. Um, it was my first time seeing Brody King properly, and I was quite impressed with his his look and size and stuff. Uh, PCO, of course, I saw the year before when he took on Walter and fucking nearly killed himself on a moonsault at Joey Janela's spring break, mm. which was like his big comeback, pretty much sort of thing, or cemented his big comeback. And then it was just, it was what what baffled me, if anything, was like, yeah, we'll put New- Yuji Nagata in, who's like a former IWGP champion in the Crockett Cup. Mm hmm. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Let's go to our storyline correspondent. Bunko, bunko. <laughs> not, not so much why in like a negative way, but it's like he's he's pretty much there's like they proper hype him up as like a new Japan legend and stuff and like sort of one of like the strong style or well, shoot style uh, legend sort of thing. But then he sort of he's he's out in the first round. Yeah. Like, Surely he should he should could or should go further. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean that that's probably the one negative I have with this this tournament is that the you know the New Japan team as well as the Rock and Roll Express they sort of like go out in the first round. Like I can understand it with sort of like the Rock and Roll Express because it's a continuing like long term storyline that's been going back all the way since like 1986 or whenever, whenever the first Crockett Cup yeah, happened. Um, but as I say, sort of like Kojima and Nagata, them going out in the first rounds, there's there's no real explanation really. Mm. Uh, right, anyway, we'll move on. Um, we'll go on to match number six. It's for the vacant NWA Women's Championship. It's Alison Kay versus Santana Garrett's. Uh, the title was vacated by Jazz, who vacated it for medical and personal reasons after a 948-day reign. Um, uh, out comes Medusa to sort of do her in-ring bit. Um, I'd, I had two things about this. One, I'm pretty sure she had her crib motes on her fucking mobile phone. Yep, she did. <laughs> and two... I don't know why, but when she was sort of like cutting this promo, she kept leaving these sort of like dramatic pauses in between every sort of like three words, three or five words uttered. And I oh, did she, not get it. She was gone. I don't know if I'm, she was either drunk or she's been well, candy. <laughs> she was gone. <laughs> well, I mean, she, like she didn't look out of it for me. I was just thinking, are you really sort of like, you know, smelling your own farts that you're just leaving this dramatic pause in between like every half sentence because you think you're that good when in actuality it just came across as being really fucking awkward you see i thought she was stopping to read off her phone well no because she wasn't she wasn't looking down at her phone from from what i could see yeah she was just like just constantly kept i mean like it Anthony could be right. She could have been fucking out of it. She, she, could have just she sort of like... she's on she's on glue. That lady. <laughs> <laughs> she was sniffing prick stick by the bloody box crate. Summit is summit wasn't right. 
Yeah, the, the, the wheel was spinning, but the hamster's dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so before this uh, before this match kicks off, um, Jim Cornette makes sure to take a shot at uh, Vinny Mac, um, just basically saying sort of like, yeah, the uh, the championship we call it a belt here, which is sort of like you know we're not like um, other. Uh, senior citizens who are revolt, who are afraid of certain words it's like yeah. pretty much any word is uh is is free to say here in the nwa which sort of explains why jim Cornette doesn't work for nwa anymore <laughs> um, um yeah again I, I must have just hit a bit of a lull in terms of watching this show because bar the finish i didn't really have anything really for this match um, i also have nothing I have, <laughs> I have plenty because uh, as this oh, match is cool. going on, I was sat next to my wife, uh, who when Medusa came out, <laughs> um, and I've got quotes from my wife here and <laughs> quotes from Jim Cornette, so this could be quite entertaining. Uh, so <laughs> Medusa's come out, and my wife goes, "God, that is rough." <laughs> That's just, well, oh, well, second. I'd, I, mean, I, did, I did have a, I did have, I did have in my notes that sort of like Medusa and her five head come to the ring, but I just felt that was a bit, <laughs> I, I felt that was a bit rough. But you know, you've sort of you've you've opened the water gates, so you know. She, kept, she carries on by say, uh, my wife saying about Medusa, you are a prime example of why not to have plastic surgery. And if God, you're she gonna, hasn't, she hasn't seen Missy Hyatt. <laughs> and if you're gonna have surgery, lift your tits up a bit. <laughs> And there was a bit where Medusa talked about like the history of the belt, and she went, "You are the history, love." <laughs> <laughs> and then Cornette says, "She looks like she looks like she could fight for that title right now." Wife goes, "No, she doesn't." Um, she calls um, Alison K. Sienna, and she calls Santana Garrett Santana Gart, which is a bit awkward. Um, Jim Cornette says here, there was a, the section with the a bit where the two ladies were giving each other knife edge chops and Cornette goes there's not a lot of margin for error there on a lady compared to the guys now <laughs> we know what he's getting at we we know what he's trying to say but couldn't he just not have said it because it's something that's like ingrained already and we know and we'll just read yeah we, we know we know Jim you don't have to say it Jim you know. Well, I, I'd like to point out, as, as soon as he said that, I think it's Santana Garrett, goes and slaps Alison K in both her tits. Yeah. And it was just like, okay then. <laughs> like, I mean, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be surprised if the next thing to come out of Jim Cornette's mouth is just sort of like, they might as well give themselves a quick rub and a squeezy squeeze. <laughs> yes, that's what we call it here on The Lost Art. <laughs> Nothing like a, a good rub and a good squeezy squeeze to finish the day. Oh, he doesn't. Or, or start the day. That's what you're into. Anyway. <laughs> That's the uh, sex education section out of the uh, podcast. <laughs> And if, it's, and if that's why you're listening to us, boy, are you in fucking trouble with your life. <laughs> your life is taking a massive fucking tumble if you're coming to us for second tips. Christ, I'm married. <laughs> uh. Yeah, but this was a bit, yeah, anyway, the the crowd was very dead for this as well. The crowd was very dead for this match. And I thought it was quite messy. It looked like a match that had just been put together, not five seconds before. I mean, it, it, I think they made mention of just sort of like it, um, like it only been put together in sort of like the couple of hours leading up to the show, yeah. which I don't know whether that's sort of like a kayfabe reason to excuse, excuse the quality or whatever. Because, like, you know, unfortunately, we don't have Jim Ross just sort of like calling it bowling shoe ugly. Then that would be the indicator that, yeah, it's it's shoot not good. <laughs> no, it isn't designed <laughs> to be bad. Um, I mean, I must say, I thought Santana Garrett was, I thought that I thought Santana Santana Garrett was decent, but I thought Alison Kay was just sort of like a little bit, a little bit off. Like, I mean, I'm. I'd, mm. 
I'm used. I have seen her have better matches before. I don't know whether they just sort of like they didn't mesh well together or whatever. But I mean, it may just be me, but that's that's what I saw anyway. I, I mean, I yeah. thought I thought Garrett was Garrett was decent. Alison Kay was a bit off. Um, so the finish comes when uh, Alison Kay uh, hits Garrett with a discus clothesline to win the match in the title in eight minutes fifty five. Uh, as I say, it was a as I say, it was just a very, very flat match, really. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. There was, you know, it, it just, again, it, the crowd were almost in, the crowd were into it, as you say, and they didn't, it didn't feel like they did a lot to try and get the crowd into it either. Mm. And, you know, I mean, Alison Kay's supposed to be wrestling as a heel, but didn't really use any, she, she didn't do anything heelish. She didn't, you know, she didn't play up to that um, up until until after the match really yeah exactly until after the match and by then everyone was just happy it was over yeah you know, they could they could have done this match in three minutes and you know we wouldn't have missed anything mm. mm-hmm. uh coxie what do you think of this one yeah uh like the boys have already said, it wasn't very really anything special. It probably could have been done in three minutes or so, but I'm guessing they wanted to give it at least a bit of time to break up the, the tournament because, like, we have this, we have uh, Colt and Willie Mack later on, don't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then you've got, uh, of course, Magnus and Skull headlining. But I don't know. It, it's like my mo- notes I made was I. I like it's read somewhere, it said only it was a few days before the jazz pulled out. Mm. So whether it was like a last minute scramble to find an opponent, it got to Monday morning or Sunday morning or whatever, and it's like, right, shit, who do we who forgot who was available and nearby? It's like, oh, Santana Garrett. <clears throat> um might have been the case. Uh there's I think it's Alison K goes hit the the Lariat, which I didn't even know was a finisher. And then it, uh, I think Jim Connett did call it something, but I can't. I don't catch what he says. Neither do I. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if it's maybe it was there was like a lack of an agent or something for it, maybe, and it was a case of right, you two put a match together, uh, go ten minutes or less, mm. and that's mm. probably what this came out with, no doubt. If it was because it was, I'm guessing there was probably more focus, if anything, on Magnus and Skirl and uh, the overall the Crockett Cup, so. Yeah, that's that's probably where you say like most of the uh, most of the focus is going to be in in terms of in terms of booking and production, really. Mm. Um, speaking of uh, Magnus and Skull, uh, there's another little vignette uh, giving me and Anthony pleasant memories of the G1 Supercard. Uh, Yay! I, I didn't really have <laughs> anything of note here. The only thing I have in my notes is just sort of like Nicholas is incredibly great at sort of promo cutting or speaking or whatever I will say this about Nicholas he looks like a top guy oh yeah you know what I mean yeah. he presents the way he presents himself the way he talks the way he, 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 he pres- the way he presents himself he as a top guy not just it's not I'm not talking about oh um, let's give an example of it's not something that a company has told him to do. This is him simply being him, but he he, he presents himself as a leader, as a as a top guy, and you th- and you get that aura off him that he is the top dog in the NWA uh, locker room, and that he, he is maybe not not pulling the strings, so to it, but he is sort of uh, a person that people look to. He just looks like a champion. He looks like a leader. The way he talks and everything on the and and, and interviews on commentary, whether you think he's in character or not, whether this is a character or not, we don't know. Mm. Maybe it's just him being him. And sometimes they are the best characters when they are just themselves. And I think yeah. this is I think this is ninety percent him, ten percent character work. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why it worked. He, he him especially. I think. It works so well with him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it, yeah, you'd sort of like, you look at Nick Aldis and you sort of believe that he is an NWA world champion. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've not been shy about saying that. I, I think he's the best wrestler in the world today. Um, 
as a total package that is, you know, he he presents himself as the world champion and it feels like it means something to him to be world champion. And, you know, to oh, even, I don't know if anybody else has watched the 10 pounds of gold series. Um, but I mean, I watched all 70 episodes of the 10 pounds of gold series and, you know, he, throughout the whole time where he's got the belt in that, he's talked about how, you know, he's trying to bring the NWA title back to prominence. He's trying to go out there and put it in, you know, in front of people's faces to say, look, we are back. We are, you know, this company. And I think he's the perfect person to have chosen to do that. Mm-hmm. He has ele- he has elevated that title. Yeah, it was it was already already held in high regard, but I think when it's gone when it was in TNA, it sort of lulled it a bit. Yeah, and I think what he's doing now, he's he's really brought that belt back to the importance that it was way yeah. back when. Yeah, it's like you think about in the time where it it went from TNA to to when Billy Obscurity. Corbin bought it, it was ob- no no. They, they played on NWA Power, actually, a cut from the Jim Cornette podcast, where they said, so Billy Corgan's bought the NWA. Why? And they laughed <laughs> about it, because it doesn't mean anything. And now, and you look at it now, and that's all been done, you know, and, you know, from nobody, nobody knew who Tim Storm was, mm-hmm. you know, and he had the belt, and then, you know, as soon as Aldis got it, it's you know it's gone from strength to strength. I, I, I think he, he said it in his promo on the first episode of Power, from a punchline to a headline. Mm, and yeah. to me, it feels like that's what they've kind of that's what he's done. You know, mm. I, I don't I don't see anybody else in the company that could have done that with. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's there are very few people that are currently in the NWA at the moment that would be able to. Be on that, on the same level that the oldest is at the moment. I definitely agree with that. Uh, so Caprice Coleman is at ringside with all three members of Midnight Express: Stan Lane, Dennis Condroy, and beautiful Bobby Eaton. Uh, just a nice feel-good moment, uh, especially with Dennis Condroy uh, just announcing that he's beaten. Uh, must have been like throat cancer, um, given the state of his voice, um, but. I can imagine if you were sort of like a long-term NWA fan, um, you know, from from a young age, that this was this was a very nostalgic little segment for you. Mm. Uh, so yeah, we'll get on to the uh, semi-finals of the Crockett Cup. So match number seven is the wild card uh, duo of Royce Isaacs and Tom Latimer versus Flip Gordon and Bandido. Um, say this was. It's a quick match, only went seven minutes fifteen. Um, not as many innovative spots from um, Flip and Bandido, um, but I did enjoy the little spot where um, Flip Gordon, from a wheelbarrow position, uh, transitions into arm dragging Bandido into a cannonball yeah. for Isaacs when he was sat in the corner. I thought that was really really nice. Um, and then the main story for this match, uh, Flip Gordon connects with a 450 splash, but then immediately grabs at his injured knee. And uh, that is the source to which the heels been to work on. Um, before Bandido is able to come in and get a hot tag, he's yanked off the apron by Isaacs. And uh, it allows uh, Latimer to roll up flip using the height, using the tights and they advance to the final. Um, as I say, like it didn't go too long, but I thought it was an OK, OK match, really. I'm inclined. Again, I'm inclined to agree. It told a story. It told the story of Flip hurting his knee, which gave the heels something to focus on. And, you know, the, there wasn't... I, I, I've written down there are six flips in this one. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so they calmed that down a little bit, which, you know, I appreciate. Um, the only thing I didn't like was the flossing in the ring. I hated that. Oh, that was I ridiculous. That. Oh my yeah. god! Why, why was that a thing? Why was that and, a thing? And you can tell because sort of like right after they do it, they sort of like go to the crowd like yay, and there's next to no reaction. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure, pretty sure there was a couple of boos mixed in there as well. 
Oh, you, you, you could hear guns clicking. Like. <laughs> <laughs> there's actually a point where, where they start doing it and there's a little bit of a silence there where everyone's going, what the fuck are they doing? It was, it was it, yeah. Oh, what the hell was it about? What the yeah. hell was that about? What are you doing, lads? Get it sorted out. Fucking millennials. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking millennials. That, that's perfect, though, isn't it? That's, that's exactly what yeah, it, is. it is. Stop <laughs> playing fucking Fortnite and do some proper fucking work. Do some proper fucking gaming. <laughs> you dickheads. Right. <laughs> Get out. To, to coin an old term, me and Bunkle started using in, in Lost in Lost Our Wrestling uh, pretty much early on for Bandido and Flip Gordon. It's pretty much, flip de doo bro. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Anthony, what do you think of this one? Yeah, I liked it. But, uh, yeah, but I, I liked I liked these four guys. I do, and I thought they they worked really, really, really well together. Um, match lasted what was it seven minutes something like that? Seven minutes fifteen. Yeah. Um, I don't get why there was a bit where Isaacs and Latimer go to the outside, forgotten how. And then Medusa's still there. Like, mm. she forgot to leave after the first... <laughs> after the last match. It's like... Oh, it was like... You know, she just blacked out for five minutes. <laughs> she had a different fucking match. It was... The, I thought... Because I didn't know she was there. I didn't see her there. And then all of a sudden, she is, like, giving him advice. If I was like that, like, who's this crazy lady? And why is she... Hey, why is she still here? <laughs> what, what's she giving us advice for we've done pretty well without her so far we beat all those blokes in the battle royal you, you, you know you got your first round victory the hell is she doing now I just think she, I think she blacked out and was just there and had to... <laughs> it was very confusing because it was like yeah. the, the commentators picked up on it and were like oh she must be sharing her like 30 years of knowledge and I was like only 30 years uh, and, oh, then she, okay. and then she just she just dis, she just disappeared after this yeah. like and then she comes like she comes out with them for the finals but like she literally only walks out with them and then she disappears again yeah she doesn't she doesn't actually like if she's coming out i, I was confused because i was like what is are they saying that she's she's their manager now and but then she doesn't interject in the match i don't i don't know why she was there I, she was I, awful i think she's still there <laughs> she's still there and she's just phasing in and out she's Some, waiting for, sometimes she's waiting, people are there she's sometimes they're not you know the, she's, the, waiting. she's waiting for this year's this year's edition of the cocky cup <laughs> oh but this year's was going to move meant to move to Georgia I believe uh, but I can just see like some cleaner there at the arena and be like some guys are like you see Medusa it's like Medusa <laughs> bitch never left <laughs> <laughs> Unless she's still sort of stood there, just like waiting for nothing. <laughs> or just Rivering, slumped in the away. chair. <laughs> time to go. Time to go home now, Medusa. <laughs> <laughs> she just holds the arena like an old old lost spirit. <laughs> like ghost hunters, get on it, lads. Come on, we need that. <laughs> She just appears in the, in the night to random tag teams, gives her advice, and just disappears into the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> Legends no, say we... that when put together, tag teams are struggling, she appears. <laughs> Parts of Winston Medusa, and then disappears into the night. <laughs> if you say Medusa three times into a minute, she'll come out and give you tag team advice, and then she'll. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, of course, Medusa, known for fucking tag team wrestling. I forgot. <laughs> Shit me. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> oh, fire love. Oh, she is on glue. Right. <laughs> Absolutely smothered in bricks it she is. Right. <laughs> to be God. fair, I'm surprised like not Daz or Bunkle has been like, just drop your belt into a bin and fuck off. <laughs> That's all she's known for. Let's yeah. be honest. I put things in a bin on a fucking daily basis. I'm not special, am I? <laughs> Fuck, you know. She's, she's stealing a living as far as I'm concerned. Oh, do some proper fucking work, love. Fuck me, fucking scrounger. Hell fire. 
Oh, God. <laughs> what, I... what if, she, what if I... you said that to her, though, and she's like, I can't, I've been furloughed. You know, the more, the more I think about it now, the more I think she was just a make a wish. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, not again. Up there with the fucking arm wrestler from the G1. Stop it. <laughs> We're just happy to be here. We're just happy to be here. <laughs> uh, living that is not the event. But... Right, quickly, Coxie, what's your figure this? <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, I, I quite liked this match up until they started doing the bloody floss. Oh. Right, and then. Just oh, killed it. I quite like the, the sort of sort of story and psychology on the 450 of like, oh shit, yeah, he's hurt his knee again at the same arena. Um, yeah, it's just nothing really else to add. It was. I think it was uh, obvious that was going to happen though, because they were building up that knee, the knee, the knee of Flip Gordon, the knee of Flip Gordon. It was kind of obvious that he was going to injury tweak it at some point yeah, yeah. and that would be the reason why they lose I think they set that up pretty early on so you knew it was coming mm-hmm. um, so we'll get on to match number 8 it's the second semi-final it's the Briscoe Brothers versus PCO and Brody King um, to well <laughs> Bunkle's favourite there's a twisting moonsault um, to Brody King who is on the outside from Mark Briscoe which manages to get a reaction from the crowd. Um, there's on the hard camera to the right hand side. Um, yeah, to the right hand side. There's a guy wearing a vigilante club t-shirt that is incredibly distracting. And I mean, like, I mean, you know, Anthony's talking about sort of like make a wish people. I, I wouldn't have been surprised if this was an actual make a wish contribution because he was fucking giving it socks really in sort of his dueling chance uh uh yeah the pco special swanton bomb off the top rope onto the apron um missing i believe it was mark briscoe as i say why um as i said this match started off quite um i don't want to say blase it's sort of like it started out quite wrestling orientated but then the further into the match it got it just became even more more and more mad like um mark bresco takes a body slam onto the actual concrete um because the mats have been lifted up um and then the finish there's sort of like it that was after the senton wasn't it yeah. Oh, that horrible sense yeah. on the was... PCO does every single <laughs> time onto the well, apron and misses every single time. Yeah. It looks awful. I mentioned awful. of that on the, but the, the sound it made was horrible. But then even like Jim Cornette on commentary was like, oh, he's only ever hit this once and that was back in New York a few weeks ago. But then <laughs> it's like, he's back up like a minute later, just like slamming Mark Briscoe on the floor. Mm hmm. Like, you should be dead. Yeah. He should well, at least it, fucking sell it. No. That's his gimmick, though. That's because my gimmick, w- it doesn't sell anything. That's the well, gimmick. Welcome to my issue with PCO. No selling, motherfucker. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, the finish comes about. Um, there's a standoff with chairs in the ring. Um, I think it's Jay takes the ref and um, to allow that allows. Um, or was it Mark? No, I think it was think... Mark that Mark that took the referee, and it allowed uh, Brody King to hit Jay with a chair, and then Mark um, retaliated with a chair shot of his own uh, right in front of the referee, and referee calls for the DQ, and then literally as soon as the announcer Bobby Cruz announces that uh, PCO and Brody King have um, won the match by disqualification, the fucking Briscoes jump on this poor ref. Yeah. Oh God, they... did you? Yeah. It's like literally as soon as this, as soon as it's like winners by disqualification, PCO, and immediately they fucking go Bleh! like proper fucking lay into him. Um, Jay Briscoe hits a Jay Driller on the ref, um, and then the, <laughs> there is an apron swanton that does connect, uh, but it's Mark Briscoe hitting PCO in the arm uh, while there's a load of chairs stacked upon him. Um, 
and yeah, that's obviously sort of like the story going into the final is that uh, PCO's arm is fucked. Uh, I must say I wasn't too much of a fan of this match just be- the way that it sort of broke down into sort of like vir- virgin on um, garbage trash bra- trash brawling. Um, but well, the one thing I will say about this match is that it was properly heated. Like this is the first time that you notice the the crowd like being up for something in a while. Yeah. Um, to be fair, I, I didn't like the match itself. Uh, the story, well, I say story, the story that they were trying to tell, I don't get. Because if he's going to DQ you, why has he not DQ'd them immediately when they start slamming people on the concrete outside? Because surely that's using a weapon just like using a chair is. Yeah, but I, whoa, 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 right. You, you, you're, not, you're not wielding the concrete like, like a no, fucking lightsaber. You've, you've made, yeah, you're not you've throwing made that the, around, you've are made you? The, the, you've made the decision to pull the mats up. Yeah, and? It's the intent. <laughs> you sound like a fucking VAR ref now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, to, if you're going to end in the DQ finish, then have that be the only point where... Really, you could DQ somebody. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a thing. It's not like you 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 deliberate. Well, you are deliberately doing that. You just, are you, deliberately I doing see, it. I can see your point, but then again, I can't because it's just something everyone does to make the move a bit more lethal. It's the it's the floor. You can't wield the floor. The last time I watched, I've never seen a wrestler start swinging the floor around like a lightsaber. It's, I'm, it, I'm not it, suggesting that they are swinging it like a lightsaber. I'm just I'm. Just, I'm not. I'm not arguing with it. I. I just think that, to me, if you're going to de- do a DQ finish, have that be the only point where it is a, you know, it is. Make make a point of it that, oh look, they've brought weapons into the in, in, into this. They've they've taken that next step. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I I I do see your point. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that I I I I, I hated the spot because I didn't. It sounded gross, but I just think it would have had a bit more of a a bit more of a kick if the you hadn't done that spot. And I don't think they needed to do that. If you could, if you just did it on the mats, I don't think you lose anything. Yeah, and to to be fair, like it's not the it's not the most ludicrous rule of sort of like a potential DQ like I would I can remember sort of like in oh I think it was like old Memphis territories or like any territories that are owned by um Bill Watts where they constituted sort of like someone being thrown over the top as a disqualification or someone coming off the top rope as a disqualification so you know it's not the most far-fetched way of sort of doing a DQ yeah I'm not I'm not saying that's where I would have stopped it because no. I, 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 I completely see what Ant's saying and I completely see what everybody else is saying that, you know, people do this all the time. Mm-hmm. But I think you would have had the same, you, you could have had the same thing if you, an, a bigger reaction to the ending if you just left the mats down. Mm. Yeah. But you, you, you're not causing injury. To, well, there's yeah. not the risk of injury as well because, you know, it is concrete that you're getting slammed on. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but other than that, I, I can't stand PCL. I hate him. Oh, join the club, mate. Join uh, the club. I, I, I don't get it. I think the gimmick is ridiculous. He's not human. Well, he clearly is. I can see his flesh. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, <he's> not <laughs> okay, I know. okay, that's the category for human now. They have flesh. Well, <laughs> you know, it's true, though. You know, I'm not, he's not. He's not some cyborg, is he? No. You know, and it just, oh, it bunker, just it, it seems, it seems like, like it exists. <laughs> like they just walk around. It seems like a lazy excuse for him not to sell anything because he can't be asked. You, know, you forget about when Kane with the big red machine with his his uh, flash arm sticking out. Well, I mean, the, the, yeah, but they never they never said he was actually a machine. That was just like a nickname. They never it said was he was actually that a machine. Point. They didn't say he wasn't human. They're trying to te- they're trying to tell me that him, PCO is not a demon. human. They call him the devil's favorite demon. They call him a demon. Demons aren't. Yeah, later, later on in his career, I think we're talking about sort of like early 
<laughs> Early 1998, Kane. Oh, yeah, well, he mm-hmm. looks a bit dodgy, soddy. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. He looked like a freak. He's just, well, probably was a freak back then. Yeah, he could do what he wants. But even the kip-ups, the, the Kane and Uncane are known for them little kip-ups and not not selling shit. Yeah, I, I don't I, like it. I don't I, like it. PCO does it too often. It yeah. was like... Um, maybe maybe, maybe, maybe for, it's that. Yeah. <laughs> Because he does yeah. it at the G1 Supercar, where Tama Tonga and Tonga just throw it, like powerbomb him from, from the ring to the outside, mm. and he just sits back up. Yeah. I was like, hey, hang on a minute, pal. <laughs> 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 just, just can't. Just... I mean, the crowd did pop for it, because they were like, oh, my God, you should be dead. Started that sound like a chant then, didn't it? <laughs> you can have that one, PCO, if you listen. <laughs> but he, 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 I think he does it where he's, it's like I said to this, he's a bit of a spot monkey. Yeah. Oh, he's, he's a, he's a massive, monkey. massive spot monkey. He's, I think he's done one thing once, got very excited, think, right, that's what they love, I'm going to keep doing it. But he's doing this, he's doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And because he knows that works. He's not going to change. He's not going to change until people stop coming to see him, until people stop buying his shit, until people stop chanting him. He's not going to change. Yeah. No, should he? No, no, I agree. He, he shouldn't. Um, you know, it's it, if it works for him, fine. It does. It, it, it doesn't work on any level for me, uh, unfortunately. And if and if he's such a badass and you know sits up out of anything, the point where they're not actually holding him. And the guy, and whichever Briscoe it is, does the sw- you know does his swanton off the off the top onto the ring apron onto him. Why don't he just move? Nobody's holding wasn't, him there. Was, wasn't one of them holding the chairs on the top of him? Can, well, one can of the you other, not slide uh, out from underneath? Can you not slide out? From, nobody's holding. Oh well, there is no me, pressure on him whatsoever. Just flying to the air then as well, mighty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you can move. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can move. I just you don't. Can move. Apparently, you can sit up after being <laughs> fucking a no cell being power being power bombed to outside of the ring. Just fucking move, you dickhead. <laughs> this is that. This is what we take from this match is fucking keep keep your mats down and move your dickhead. There we are. <laughs> right, move on. <laughs> um. It's, Anthony, it's, I need to get your thoughts on this match, mate. Oh, my thoughts? Well, I, 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 right, I'm going to say this right now. I like PCO and I like this thing. I think it's done way too much. I think it's done way too often. And it's going to wear off sooner rather than later for him, which is a bad thing. The, 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 the Briscoe's kicking off after. Did that lead to anything? I don't know because I don't want no. to bother. Well, but, I don't. So what was the... I, I, if it led to something, as then coming back into the end of way, or coming into Ring of Honor and going for the tag titles or probably kicking off or whatever, if it led to something, fair enough. But this was a kick-off for the sake of... They just look like sore losers. And them, yeah. and that's not what them boys are uh, meant, meant to be. The smash mouth, the hard-hitting, they don't give a shit. Mm. They, don't, they don't just... They're not sore losers, if you know what I mean. That's not them. And that's what I didn't like about this. That's what I really didn't like. But the, the match itself was fine, wasn't mm. it? It was fine. It was fine. It was, it was what it was. It was smash mouth. It was hard hitting. We're not going to see great technical wrestle, wrestling from either of these teams. So, again, we got what we expected. Mm. Uh, Coxie, thoughts? Yeah, uh, no real difference of opinion, really. It was an all right match, but it was, again, like I I saw the Briscoes at a company we won't name when they teamed up with Ring of Honor and they took on, I think it was Team Single. Mm. And it was the same thing. It sort of started out almost like a proper wrestling match and you sort of, you knew going into it, like, this this isn't going to like last for long. And before you knew it, they were going around the, the entire bloody venue just kicking fuck out of each other. Uh, so yeah, uh, so the continuation really does doesn't it have like the, the injured PCO shoulder, which all factors into the 
the final, final later on for a little spot, which is which probably Bunk will be gritting his teeth at. But we'll come to that later. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. <laughs> Uh, we need to get on to match number nine, which is for the NWA National Championship. Champion Willie Mack versus the challenger Colt Cabana. Um, interesting little production fuck up um, because I'm assuming there was supposed to be a promo package for this match because that's what they were inkling towards when they showed the match graphic. But then they just immediately, um, there's a, Colt Cabana's music just starts playing. And um, t- I think it's Joe Galley who's just sort of like, oh, well, uh, we're not going to have an opportunity to show the promo package. And it's just like, for fuck's sake. Come on, lads. Um, so match kicks off. Um, nice little bit of uh, back and forth. Uh, Willie Mack has a really good vertical leap uh, for someone who weighs nearly 285 pounds. Um, it's a nice... Um, Nice, uh, nice leg drop and a really good corner splash. Um, and then the exact next spot, uh, Willie Mack goes for sort of like a corner drop kick. Colt Cabana moves and he sort of like goes through the ropes and all the way to the outside, which was a mad spot. Really, really mad spot. It looked to me like he was going through that for that uh, the the Miz style clothesline in the corner. We you know mm. where he puts his legs through the uh, the, the the top and middle rope. So like that, and Coke, again, it just smashed. It, it sounded awful. Mm. Ugh. Yeah, it was a nasty bump that he, uh, nasty bump that he took. Um, so there's a nice uh, standing jumping meteora uh, from Willie Mack, and he uh, channels his inner Jeff Cobb by uh, nipping up out of a, um, nipping up out of a Simone drop, and then hitting a standing moon salt. Uh, there's a nice sent on cannonball uh, in the corner from Matt for a close two. Uh, Cabana nails a really nice springboard moonsault for another close two. Uh, Willie Mack hits a hook kick but then misses a frog splash. Uh, Colt immediately misses a top rope moonsault uh, which allows Willie Mack to nail a pop up forearm. And then he rushes into the corner but uh, Colt kicks him out of it. Uh, knocks him down and uh, hits the Superman press, which is basically like a flying um, roll up and uh, pins Willie Mack and captures the national title in eight minutes, 45. Uh, we'll talk about the post-match in just one second, but um, I must say for this match, I really quite enjoyed it. Uh, I thought it was a, I thought it was quite a good showcase uh, for Willie Mack. Sort of like he, he was, was quite similar to, the match that Jeff Cobb and Will Ospreay had um, at the G1 Supercard uh, last episode. Um, just like a really nice showcase. I think Willie Mack and Jeff Cobb are sort of like in the same mix of big guys who can do athletic stuff but don't do it too often. I think Willie Mack does it a bit more than Jeff Cobb does, but I don't think it's like overloaded too much. Um, and I thought Colt Cabana was decent here as well, and it was nice to see him, uh, nice to see him win the title. Um, so yeah, what do you guys uh, what do you guys think of this one? I can say I really quite enjoyed this match myself. Um, I I would like to see a bit more a bit more selling on some of the things that they did, but I understand why you know they wanted to make that action that little bit faster, you know, just to make it stand out a bit more. But yeah, it was a really nice match. Really impressed with Willie Mack in the two two shows I've seen him on now. Um, because I saw him out on the 70th anniversary show as well when he picked up the title. And, uh, yeah, he seems, uh, you know, he seems pretty good. Colt Cabana, I mean, I've never been the biggest fan of him, but in, at least in this one, he was less silly. So hmm. I uh, I appreciate that a lot. And, you know, he is actually a good wrestler when he wants to be. So yeah. do that. Oh, wait, you're in AEW, so I don't care. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, right. Fucking hell. <laughs> Oh, fire! Oh, no, right. I'm go- I'm not going to go. The match, the match, the match, Anthony. Talk about the match. Right. Um, I I agree in terms of Colt Cabana can be very silly in the ring and not. Um, is that a fault of his? Maybe, but then again, he's got where he is today doing that so again it's the pco thing 
why should he change what gets him over in the first place? He, he can be a good wrestler, which is what he was here. He can be a good wrestler. He can be in a good end at the same time. But that's silly stuff that you talk about. It's what's got him here. So why should he change? It's one of them. It's one of them. But I, uh, I will say this on Willie Mack. Willie Mack is so freaking underrated, man. I I, I thought he, this was a great showcase for him. And I know he's is he in Impact? Is he in Impact? He's in, he's he is in Impact. impact. Yeah. He's, oh. uh, I think he's X Division champ actually. Uh, again, uh, again, no disrespect to Impact. Re- oh, what am I talking about? Complete disrespect to Impact Wrestling. No disrespect to the X Division title because I know that actually carries some weight about it. But I think Willie Mack can do better. I think oh. he can do better than that. I think he is better than that, and I think. Uh, it could be. They do say at the end of this match that they could see Willie Mack go for the NWA Heavyweight champ, title, which is not a completely far-fetched uh, idea based on what I've seen from him. Hmm. Um, I, again, I think he deserves better. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I must say, like I've only ever seen um, before watching this match. I've only ever seen like clips of Willie Mack. This was my first like proper match of of watching him, and yeah, as I say, there's no reason why particularly with in terms of NWA power, if he'd have stuck around and not sort of like prioritised it impact wrestling, that there's no reason why he couldn't have built him up as being sort of like a contender close behind Marty Skull. I I feel anyway. Mm. It could have been in that Ricky Stark spot, you know, uh, that, yeah. from, from, you know, if we're going right, you know, if we're talking power, you know, picking up that, you know, that TV title, and you know, or whatever it may be, and yeah, like you say, working towards the an NWA heavyweight title shot, which to me means way more than anything in Impact Wrestling. Mm-hmm. But you know, it, it's it's one of them. You never you can never say never. You know. Yeah, definitely. Um, Coxie, what do you think of this one? Uh, yeah, it was quite. Uh, I quite enjoyed this one again. It was it was different and interesting. Uh. I quite also like the the design of the title, as strange as it looks, but uh, Willie Mack I've seen briefly before in like indie on some indie shows. Uh, he reminds me a bit of Keith Lee, just less talented. Mm. And uh, of course, uh, I think it's Cornet. I want to say is like heavily putting over like Cabana um, is a bit of a catch as catch can. Uh, specialist and he's lived in he's moved to the he moved to the UK and he lived in the UK for a bit training and, and catch rest and all that sort of thing and he's a bit of like an NWA because uh, he did appear on Power at one point didn't he briefly <clears throat> he was a, he was on Power for like the first five or six episodes I think hmm. um, and now he's then, an AEW but yeah uh, interestingly though as well I I did find out through some research uh, they could only really give it to Cabana anyway because they, apparently Triple A sent a cease and desist to both NWA and ROH regarding Willie Mack because he was still under contract with Lucha Underground at the time of course so, yeah. it did lead to a lawsuit but then he apparently signed to he signed, that's what he signed a contract with he signed a contract with Impact only a few days after the Crockett Cup so right okay yeah. Oh, that explains it then. Yeah. It's, it's just a shame that he's he's stuck where he is because I think there is there is there is talent in that in that man. Definitely, definitely. Hmm. Uh, so we'll get on to the semi-main event. It's the finals of the Crockett Cup tournament, and the, this match will also determine who becomes the new. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I have. Yes, I have. <laughs> um, yeah, the. Presents the uh, the Crockett Cup and the tag team belts. Uh, they put it on the uh, ringside table, uh, and uh, Billy Cor- Billy Corgan and the uh, surviving members of the Crockett family are there, and they pose with the cup and the tag belts. Um, and then Caprice Coleman is in the ring with uh, the Russian Nightmare Nikita Koloff. Um, very smooth, very competent promo, I have to say. Um, and as I said, like um, from reference to the start of the pay-per-view when I said that um, Caprice Coleman did actually come up with a funny line, 
Um, after Nikita's been talking for a little bit, like Caprice just sort of like comes back, uh, has this sort of like puzzled look on his face, and he just goes sort of like, um, I'm just wondering, what happened to your accent? And Nikita just sort of like does this thing of like, well, I've been, you know, living in the US for like 35 years. It's, is it any wonder that the sort of like the accent's worn off? Which was, you know, it was a fun, it, it yeah. was an entertaining line from uh, from Mr. Coleman. Um, so yeah, it's Kos, uh, I was about to say Kozlov then. Uh, Koloff, um, very respectable, very down to, very down to earth promo. Uh, brings out Magnum TA. Um, it's like Magnum TA is always seen as sort of like what could have been. Um, I know Jim Cornette like says after this whole segment uh, wrapped itself up that. Uh, Magnum TA was pretty much going to be a future NWA world champion before his uh, his car accident, uh, like at the age of 27, and it pretty much cut cut his career short. Um, but he he's there, living in present, comes out on a Segway, which you know, it's the modern modern way of getting about. Um, and yeah, that's just the uh, that's just the, the 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 little segment that goes on before the semi main event. Um, in the it's finals match in the Crockett Cup tournament, and the winners will be crowned the new NWA Tag Team Champions. It's the wild card team of Tom Latimer and Royce Isaacs versus the villain Enterprise team of PCO and Brody King. Uh, as we said before, Medusa comes out with Latimer and Isaacs and then just disappears. Nowhere to be seen ever again. As I say, probably... Uh, probably doing her best sting impression just sort of like hiding up in the rafters of this uh, particular building. Mm. She could be behind you right now. She could be there whispering <laughs> tag team advice. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed everyone listens to this literally just turn around. <laughs> like Guarantee. It. Guarantee it. Um uh, villain enterprises doing what um Juice Robinson failed to do. Uh, the G1 supercars, they actually come out selling their injuries uh, before the match uh, kicks off. Uh, once again, this is another match where I didn't really make any notes of, bar what uh, what goes on with uh, PCO's injury, if uh, other people want to talk about it. Um, well, I mean, I've put the heels work on Brody King to start the match just because you know, PCO is supposed to be the more, more injured one of the two and can't use his, is it right arm, I believe? Yeah, it's his uh, right arm. Uh, at all. Um, but yeah, then they do, Brody King gets the, air quotes, hot tag, and we get the, uh, the, the fix my arm spot. He just basically hot shots. Brody King is just like on the apron on the outside and he just basically turns like PCO's arm as if he's going to give him like an arm wrench and then just sort of like gives like a hot shot and uh, PCO's arm is miraculously fixed. Don't call. Stage is yours. (laughs) Well, uh, the words I've written down being nicely, it's hokey as fuck. Um... Uh, to uh, to say um, you know, doing damage to the business. Um, yeah, just, <laughs> you, need to do it just... in a, you need to do it in a Jim Ross impression, just sort of like <laughs> wrenching the arm of one that's injured exposes the business. And well, this is just just coming from a wrestling fan out of Cardi County, County, Georgia, or Oklahoma, I should say. It's, uh, I'm just giving my two cents here. Exactly. Uh, that, that's, that's, that, it's awful. It's absolutely it's, awful. It's it's incredibly hokey. Yeah. It, 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 well, this is this has come this has come from like two people who are not big fans of, of PCO. Um, yeah. And do, do do you have anything to say on this particular spot? I thought you loved it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It was really tempting for me to say that, but no, I thought I, I thought they were going to do something like make it look slightly real, but they didn't, and just yanked his arm over a rope, and I thought, oh, 
They don't teach you that in medical school. So you think if you <laughs> walk into your NHS, oh, we are falling off. Hang on, give us it. Bring the ring in. Right, get in. <laughs> Put your arm over there. Down you go. Oh, no, it was, it was, oh, I was going to say something fucking awful. No, it was pretty, um, it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. But apart from that, pretty much smash mouth, pretty much in your face. Um, yeah, it's what it is. I will say um, another comment from Mrs. Not Daz. Um, <laughs> when Nikita Koloff, I, I, I love Nikita Koloff. I think he's awesome. And I said, now I said, now that. I said, now that, love. I said it twice. I say now that is is a wrestler and what a wrestler is meant to look like. And without missing a beat, she goes, well, he's a lot better than that slag from before. Then <laughs> 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 we turned around, she was there like, shit, no. <laughs> but, um... And then obviously Medusa came out with lots of eyes exactly. And then I oh, oh, held her breath. Is, there was just like this silence, and then oh for fuck's sake, <laughs> like that. But it, it, it was very weird. The PCO no selling things. And, yeah, it was. Didn't um. I, feel, I can't remember if it's this much back before where PCO asks. Uh, Brody King to like slap him on the chest he like pulls his thing down and goes slap me slap me and I was just going oh this has got a bit um, <laughs> this is yeah. taking a very strange turn can we not do that again please <laughs> just remember <laughs> just remember where you are and what you're doing I'm surprised your missus didn't walk in and just walk, I was walk, walk past and just look at you and go a bit gay that <laughs> but, it, but could you imagine me sat there no these two boys are slapping each other. Why do I keep saying boys? Fucking hell. <laughs> Bring me another boy. No, oh, no, no. no. Right. He's, He's thinking upset. about boys. He's thinking about boys. He's I thinking can't about boys. He's obsessed. He's fucking <laughs> obsessed. I can't help thinking I've given myself a new fucking character to a deity. Really. <laughs> well, no, this, this one I'm not willing to follow through on. And I don't want to use the word follow through anywhere near the boys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this is, I, I, I got tired of seeing PCO at this point. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I like it for. I, I can enjoy it for a few minutes, but this was just too ridiculous. It's too much. Yeah. The the, the arm spot just completely weird because uh, I'm there in my brain trying to figure out how that fixes whatever was wrong with his arm in the first place. Don't know if we got a, a diagnosis for it, or, but again, it was just a bit okay. wha- wacky, wacky, like Looney Tunes, Space Jam, Space Jam. The, the it's, was, very, the, it's very Space Jam. There we they, go. they mentioned it in commentary of like they were like, oh, I think his arm, his shoulder's dislocated or something. He's like, but then even they were like, when he's like, Brody grabbed my arm, whatever, and then even they're like. What what's he doing? Like, like it made yeah. no sense to even to them. Because like, we all know that to cure a dislocated uh, 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 shoulder is to pull it some more. Is to give it a wrestling. Is to do a wrestling move. Is is to, to proper pull it again. <laughs> just just to give it, just to make it better. Again, not a doctor. Mm. Yeah. Um, so the finish comes when Brody King gives uh, Latimer a black hole slam, and then PCO hits a very... Um, well, it's a love handle slam. Am I missing something here? Wow, wow, fucking hell, that... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh. Right. Why is oh. it called the love handle oh. slam? Not, 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 Daz, not Daz, bring your boys in, get them to sit down next to Lewis. You're about to be educated. <laughs> We need the technical difficulties uh, being all in here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> can, I, can I just say, given yeah, my so... profession and my job, can we not do the boys thing? <laughs> can, can we please not do that? I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. But you don't. <laughs> you don't. Okay, yeah. so... Don't spin it off. 
the, <laughs> love, up, love, handle, love handle slam from Brody King. Uh, PCO hits a very sloppy moonsault onto the legs of uh, Tom Latimer. And Villain Enterprises win. They win the Crockett Cup and they are the new NWA Tag Team Champions in 6 minutes 40. Um, I'm pretty sure we've had our, our talk on sort of like the match itself. Uh, actually, Bar Cox. Coxie, what do you think of this one, mate? I I, f- I think there is there's one point in this match that is a lot of it. This match has listening more to the commentary, if anything. Uh, there was a lot of it where uh, they're all talking about how Brody wasn't well. The PCO wasn't really checking on Brody or something. He was a lot of pretty much they were putting over how he's meant to be selling his injuries. And he's not really doesn't really seem overly bothered about how Brody King's getting like beaten down by uh, Thomas and Lattimore, and uh, but it was um, yeah the the shoulder bit would just seem daft, but again it is like they were putting over the thing of like it's PCO he is not human, which kind of shits on and if in the end of way really stands for. Hmm. Uh, but again, like, yeah, the love handle slam three weeks prior, I did white collar four. And as part of the, the finish for the match came, I sort of, I gave Joey, uh, as Joey said, give me a boss man slam. So I did. And then the sort of, it, sort of me and the boys have always had it, uh, not you, not you, Daz, don't worry. Not Daz even. Not, not Daz. Again, can we stop with the fucking boys thing? <laughs> Fucking, it's, this is going red. It's, got, it's gone too far. Delete, delete, delete. delete, delete. <laughs> yeah, um, essentially, it got referred to as like the love handle slam. And so, and if we ever see it now, it gets referred to as the love handle slam rather than anything else. But I quite enjoy it. Like, I quite liked how they did it together. But there was there was a point in commentary where I think it was Cornette was saying how the, the tournaments used to be sometimes over an afternoon into an evening or over two nights. Which probably would have done better in in terms of probably not for in terms of revenue and stuff. It probably would have cost double for the arena, but it, like we probably could have had, could have had better matches because this probably ran six forty. Like it could have been better because like, but Royce and Latimer did what four matches mm. if you include the Battle Royal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. That... <sighs> Yeah, you could you could this match probably deserved a bit longer or well, not deserved, probably should have gone a bit longer. Um you know, to have Latimer and Isaacs go all you know, have four well, three matches to get here and then lose without much of a fight really in six minutes. Um, you know, to this now bad. Uh you just <laughs> just just a shame really. I, what I don't understand is, why didn't the Briscoes come out and just ruin this main event? Oh, co-main event. Would that not have like made sense as the payoff of what they just did? No. No, because Jim Cornette would have had a stroke and would have just gone into it. Where the fuck is Vince Russo? <laughs> These are quite obviously bought this. To, it's a fucking <laughs> running. <laughs> but, but. Uh, maybe maybe it's just me. Maybe they did something, you know, the the next week on Ring of Honor TV or something. But I just, you know, if the Briscoes are that pissed off that they're gonna murder a poor referee and you know this then, surely just have, have have a pay off to that. Make them look, you know, they're still gonna be pissed off. You know, even if they just took out um, PCO and Brody King, you know, and we had a the, the the heels go over. It, it just would have made more sense and felt a bit better to me, you know. Mm. Yeah. But as it is, what pretty much pretty nothing match, and the main talking point was uh, exposes the business. Mm. Does expose so. the business. Um, Coxie, because you were watching a um copy of this that you got via means. Um, on the YouTube version, right after um, Brody King and PCO um, sort of like are doing the the victory pose with the belts above the head, there's sort of like a transitional cut to them being presented with the the Crockett Cup on the floor. So was there anything specific that you noticed that might have been caught here? 
Uh, nothing I noticed in my my version. Uh, there was I don't know if I, there's a possibly before this match maybe there was because there's a point where James Storm comes out before this match. Oh yeah. It's, uh, do you know what? I forgot to talk about the post match after the national title <laughs> um, title match. Um, so yeah. Uh, so going um, back to the match previously, um, James Storm had caught up, come out and basically set his sights on not only the national title, but also the uh, £10 gold, the NWA world title, which um, sort of is expanded upon a little bit in the opening episodes of uh, NWA Power. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's, yeah. that's that's pretty much all I missed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it, was, it was setting up for that, wasn't it? The, the funny yeah. thing about it was, as Jason Storm is doing the promo, he's walking around the ring, and as he's walking around the ring, he's picking up like the streamers with his feet, and he's slowly actually taking. <laughs> he's got all the streamers. Got to the point where he gets all the streamers on his feet, and he's dragging them around, and they, they just stop for a second and pick up. And Colt Commander happily um. Picks them up for him. Well, I mean, I, I thought James Storm actually covered for it quite well because he was just sort of like, ah, oh, fuck it, it's part of my new gimmick. It, it's a new thing that I'm adding to my gimmick, tassels. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a nice touch. Um, yeah, I wasn't sure if that bit had, had been cut out from the YouTube version and that. I didn't try, it wasn't mentioned. I didn't want to follow up as we sort of went straight into this, the, the following match, but there was nothing I noticed different or anything after we like in the post match so no the, the the james stuff storm stuff was on there that was just scatterbrain me just missing it um so yeah they get presented with the uh the cop and then then we're off to the main event uh which is up next actually uh for the nwa world heavyweight championship uh the villain marty skull challenging the champion the national treasure nick aldis um and the final little bit of the promo package um, reveals that Nick Aldis was initially wanting to team with Marty Skrull in the Crockett Cup, but then um, Marty just uh, threw a monkey wrench in the works and just basically challenged Nick for a shot at the uh, NWA title. Um, there was a hour-long sort of build-up um, on the NWA YouTube channel. Uh, just the basic bill to the Crockett Cup 2019 and it also featured a qualifying match of the Briscoes versus Willie Mack and Jeff Cobb which you need to go back and watch because I'm actually quite intrigued to go watch that match now that I've seen this Willie Mack match um, and they sort of they do um, they do sort of like an MMA style thing of like um, building up this match which it, it, I quite liked, really, because you had sort of, you had Caprice Coleman just basically of the case with this this segment on Ring of Honor TV of just sort of like, well, you know, I, I know that Nick wanted um, Marty to be his partner in the Crockett Cup, but then when the swerve came about and, you know, it was in actuality, Marty wanted to challenge for it. I was just sort of like, oh, OK. Um, but, you know, done in a much more, <laughs> much more professional than I've just done just now. Um, so as I said, it's it's a program that I'm going to go back and watch. But from what I saw of like the opening 20 minutes, it's a really really good watch and like quite a nice build to the match that we're just going to be talking about now. Uh, yeah. So uh, a really good seamless chain wrestling to start off with. Um, Marty, really smart move from Marty Skrull as he fakes a trip from Camille and pretty much gets her ejected. Um, and Jim Cornette actually makes like a really great point about um, rope breaks during pinfalls. He was just basically saying how um, a lot of people look at like, you know, rope breaks, uh, you know, reaching for the ropes as in a pinfall is just sort of like a coward's way out of like instead of kicking out. But he was just making the point of, you know, you're a professional athlete. You just use whatever tools are that are available to, you know, to make sure that you're still alive and kicking in a match. And I thought it was like a, quite a nice little touch. 
Um, so the main story early on is Marty Skull's back getting worked over and it uh, vamps up a little bit when Aldous uh, choke slams Marty through the ringside table. Um, this, they, I, I couldn't really tell where whereabouts uh, Aldous was busted open. Um, like Joe, Joe Galley and Jim Cornette were sort of tossing it up between um, there's a dive through the ropes that Marty hits and then like straight after Marty hits him with sort of like a straight right hand and then immediately comes up bleeding. Uh, let's see. Um, That's what I've got written down, so. Yeah, it's, it, I think it was like a spot in between, maybe. But I'm not 100%, I'm not 100% certain. It definitely happened in sort of like there. Um, so all this hits Marty with a powerbomb and goes to transition into his version of Texas Cloverleaf, which he calls the Kingsling Cloverleaf. Um, but Marty Skull does his snapping of the fingers gimmick. Um, Jim Cornette, uh, it's, you know, he's usually quite professional in these standards, is talking all over the finger spot. Oh, and it's God, sh- yeah. It's a shame as well because like most of that, most times when Mike Skull does the finger spot, you can actually hear a click coming when he actually does the snap. And I, I'm pretty sure there was a click here, but you know I couldn't really hear because Cornette was just talking over. Uh, let's see, uh, Aldis canters a chicken wing attempt with a roll up, and then instantly gets nailed with Crossroads, which is a nice little callback to uh, Aldous's two matches with Cody Rhodes. Um, referee Brian Hebner gets knocked down. And Camille comes back to ringside and she looks as if she's going to hit a spear on Marty. But then Aldous comes across um, sort of leaning into the tween gimmick that he sort of has, has like going into particularly the NWA, um, particularly into the, the power episodes. Um sort of really getting into sort of like the tweener gimmick just basically stops her sends her back sends her to the back um martin desperation hits a low blow hits his um hits his underhook um sit out slam which he calls the black plague for uh elongated two counts um marty eventually locks in the chicken wing uh aldous rose rolls through again for another close pin uh, Marty attempts a package power driver, uh, which sees Aldous roll through, uh, locks in the cloverleaf, and uh, after struggling, pulls him back into the centre, really sits back, and Marty taps out. And so Aldous wins by submission in 23.45. This, for me, was a really darn good main event, and it's what I sort of expect from these NWA main events. It Like, it... it if you were sort of like to ask me what a main event in the National Wrestling Alliance would be, I would probably show people this match. And yeah, it got over like both people, both Aldous and Skull look really good and um, crowd were into it. And as I say, yeah, really darn good, darn good main event in my opinion. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely loved this match, to be honest. Um, I think it's, it gets both, it, it, the crowd was into both guys by the end of it. And mm. I think, you know, I, I think they did like a, a really, really good job actually of um, not almost taking, I don't want to say taking heat off Nick, Nick, but the, the spot where he sends Camille back, it was like for such a simple thing to do. It was a holy shit moment. Mm. You know, it was like a, Wait a minute. The the you know the the heels not taking every chance that he's got, um you know and then you know for Marty to then turn around and kick him in the nuts it was like wait a minute we uh, like to me I was like shit double turn or what and but it you know of course it wasn't and it it was just yeah I think I loved every minute of it to be honest um you know the chain wrestling at the beginning I I, I adore wrestling like that. I, I honestly, I really do. Um, that that's that's you know that's it's it's just so good. I mean, even like like the bit where um, Aldis choke slam skirtle through the table, and he does his strut around the ring, but then he points to his hand and he's like, 
this is where the power lies. And it was like, I, I, I never expected it, never saw it coming. I was like, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was just a little thing. And I was like, yeah, you're a bit of a shit, aren't you? <laughs> but it, it, it's just, oh, it was so good. <laughs> I can't, just I, can't, so you, I can't get over it enough how good I thought this match was, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ant, what do you think? Yeah, this 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 was really, really good. It was treated and built up and presented <clears throat> like a main event. It was treated like a big deal. Yeah. With the, the referees and the, grand, uh, the grandeur of it all. And I think that's what... Me- it was already a good main event before it started. Yeah. In that, mm-hmm. um, I like the, the, the fake by school to get Camille out of the way, sort of like an Eddie Guerrero sort of thing there. Really, really love that. Uh, the fall away slam from the second rope by uh, Aldis. Um, yeah, just throwing my school over his head. Uh, amazing. <sighs> Again, I've, I've nothing, no, I don't think I've got anything bad to say about this match and these two wrestlers. Uh, another comment from the wife. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so when Camille comes back and tries to go for that spear, I go, oh, this is, you can't end it like this, surely. You can't end it like this. And then Nick Aldis, uh, the, the moment Nick Aldis steps in front of her and stops her, she, literally, with, again, without missing a beat, she goes, oh, what's the point if you have to get a woman to do it? <laughs> of which I had nothing to add because let's be honest, that, that's dangerous territory. That so I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I just agreed with it. But I, 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 from... as he slowly took off his belt. <laughs> <laughs> no, fucking hell. <laughs> which, between this and the boys' things, it's getting a bit. So I, I said it before, and I said it, and this house is fucking disintegrating. <laughs> But from start to finish, this match was it was treated as a, as a main event. It was treated as a big deal, and it it delivered. It delivered for me. It really did. It really did. Hmm. Both fantastic talents. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Fully agreed there. Uh, Coxie, thoughts on the main event? Yeah, uh, I liked the overall presentation of how it was all done, uh, especially with like Tommy Young coming out who were, like. Uh, Cornet was putting over as like the he's like oh the greatest referee of all time and that sort of thing, and even with him like sort of saying to the guy before he's like yeah I talked to you the back in your respective dressing rooms, uh, this is a, a match not a fight and all this sort of thing and I want to see it go down as such and I'm, sort of remember that and all that sort of thing, um yeah definitely match of the night. Uh, what threw me off a bit was Camille talking at one point, but mm. I don't know if that was like a Maybe the the book because in power she doesn't she has the whole thing she doesn't talk until like season three spoiler alert um so towards the end when she's like I came out to help and, and Aldis just was like no <laughs> no <laughs> go backstage um <laughs> no naughty off you go. <laughs> I will spank you later. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. What? Did I go too far? Yeah, kind of, kind of a, yeah it's kind of a shame. Yeah. Like, the, if, Let's like, keep it kayfabe, what... keep it kayfabe for fuck's sake. I know, like, if this, if this was actually the 80s, like, she probably would like, you'd make her leave and be like, go to the back. And she's leaving, just gives her a tap on the arse and be like, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not for, with these guys. For Victor and Space Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it was like... It was one of them. I think Cornet was quite into it as well. The commentary was quite into it. Uh, and I think for me, like, uh, Aldis is one of those guys where he is... He treats himself like a main event talent because he is which gave it that more feel. And I think it's because he, he has believability in himself. Like he believes he is the champion. He believes he is NWA sort of thing. And I think that's what helps has helped establish and get him over. Mm. Uh, if anything, I don't know. I can't, don't know off the top of my head how long he's been champion for now, but I could easily in this day and age, I could easily see him being possibly like the, the Bruno San Martino of this sort of era. If anything. I know he's, it was uh, first episode of Power. It was uh, it was a year 
that he'd been champ. So I think that was the year since he got beat by Cody. Mm. Um, Nick, I have, do have it here. Um, his combined two reigns have gone 855 days. Um, he will overtake Jack Briscoe in another 10 days. Well, 11 days, sorry, 866. Pat O'Connor in 903. Jeff Jarrett, uh, 1005. Um, he's, I think it's two years in Oct- on October the 21st. Yeah. That he's, uh, will be holding his, uh, well, if, unless he drops it in a, in a dramatic fashion, I, I, re- I really don't see it happening. But, um, he, he, he could easily get up to the, the likes of Dory Funk Jr., who held it for 1,563 days uh, in one title reign. Gene, Gene Kinitsky, 1,131. Ric Flair, 3,116. Maybe he'll get up there, maybe he won't. But he's already ahead of Buddy Rogers. Uh, the, the names he's ahead of Buddy Rogers, Terry Funk, uh, Christian Cage, Sting, AJ Styles. Uh, I, I could go on. I re- Dusty Rhodes. I could go on. He's he's up there. He's up there. Mm. And yeah, I, I mean, the, I can, the numbers I can, don't lie. Well, I mean, I can see him being like a. Uh, yeah, he's at 587 days plus currently. So I could easily see him being like I was saying, like this sort of generation's. Bruno San Martino, if he goes on to hold about for four years, like continuously, it wouldn't be a bad thing. Like, <laughs> no, if anything, it, it, would it, add, it would add to the prestige of it. Yeah, it would. It, it would make that belt feel so important. I mean, when you sit there and you're watching, you know, your WWE or whatever, and the belt's changing every couple of months, and then you've got, you know, this guy, you know, heading up to four years. That's that's a pro- that's a proper title reign. That's how it should be. Well, to, to give it more in in depth, sort of like Mania 36, F5, Claymore, F5, F5, kick out, Claymore, F5, F5, German, F5, kick out, F5, Claymore, free count. Well, <laughs> yeah, done in five minutes. Whereas mm. we just had 23 minutes, nearly 24 minutes with Nick Aldis and Marty Skill. Mm. Yeah. And it was a, it was a technical, technically engaging storytelling match yeah. as well. It wasn't literally just because that's it's part of the reason why I love I like wrestling. That's mainly that this is the kind of wrestling that I I go for. Like it's. WWE matches where you literally just sort of like finish your kick out rest, finish your kick out rest, finish your kick out rest is just completely lazy in my opinion. And, you know, I, I don't think this style of wrestling is done enough in my opinion. In my uh, opinion. No, I agree. That this is, Like I said, this is why I watch NWA and only NWA. Mm. You know, and I, and I know I'm not going to get this on every single show. But when it comes down to it, this is, you know, you, you, this is what your main event should be. This is what we should be building to. Mm-hmm. We don't spend six months building to five minutes of finish a kick out or, or, or even less. Yeah. You know, it's, it, it's a big build to make the match seem important to give you an important match. Mm-hmm. You know, to, yeah, this 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 is this is wrestling yeah. for me. <laughs> it's um it's interesting you were talking about the there's the possibility of uh, Nick Aldis probably to possibly being the modern day era of um Bruno Sammartino because this year's Crockett Cup was the rematch between Nick Aldis and Marty Skrull and it was just basically. It was the um, title versus um, Marty plays for the entire game. Um, that was the stipulation for this for that match. Um, what I was just wondering off you guys is, who do you think, do you think Marty Skull would be the right person to beat Nick Aldis for the title? Or do you think that 
it should be there's the possibility that you t- you could get more longevity out of a longer title reign with Nick Aldis and build somebody up that would that that would basically have a bigger payoff once they beat Nick Aldis. Uh, I think you keep the belt on Nick Aldis and uh, like you know like like we've just said it builds the prestige of the belt and of the man <clears throat> and the good for each other. Mm-hmm. Whereas like Marty's, I mean we you know breaking case head we know he's the booker in ROH and you know so how much is he just in the NWA for a quick run you know because mm. they obviously they have a good working relationship uh, and then he's going to go back to you know doing his ROH you know thing more full time you know I don't I don't think Marty's the right guy I think he's the perfect foil for another story at the you know to to come at the Crockett Cup. And I think, again, having matches with him in it builds the prestige of it. And, you know, it make a fantastic, what I would call, gateway. You know, um, I don't want to say gateway main eventer, but I suppose he is. You know, in, in the in the NWA, he's a, he's a name that, you know, he only has to come in every now and again. You know, few promos, big match at the pay-per-view, and he's... He's fantastic on the mic and it'll sell, mm. you know. Um, and I think you, you know, in terms of who could beat Nick Aldis, I think you're a few years away yet, uh, in my personal opinion. Um, but you know, you you build a guy, you know, from the ground up in the NWA. That's the can, way I'd look to do it. Can I throw out a name? I'm going to throw out yeah. a name right now and see what you all think. Tom Latimer. Yeah, I can I can go for that eventually. Uh, I'm not saying tomorrow. I'm not by by no. all any no, no, no. But eventually, I think no. I'm just going to throw that out there. My only issue with Tom Latimer is he needs a lot of character work because I yeah. I can't tell you what his motivations are other than ah, I'm buddy with Nick Aldis. Yeah. Well, this, it's it's funny funny to say that. I mean, I don't really want to get too far ahead of themselves but i seem to remember in episodes of power that i've i've watched um like joe galley will look to sow seeds of doubt of like possibly you, you know there's the nick aldis group potentially yeah. splitting up and tom latimer being the catalyst and latimer will come out and just say stop trying to like look for look for a drama where there is none because you know our group is as is, is as tight as it get gets. So I could pro- possibly see that I could possibly see that they might might go that way. Um, but I, I mean, I, I I don't know really. I don't know. It's it, I before you you made the mention of sort of like saying that Marty Skull was the the ring of honor booker. I wouldn't if. Marty Skull were to have beaten Nick Aldis and won the NWA title at that uh, Crockett Cup show that they were going to have this year, I wouldn't have had too much of an issue with because it's a story that's basically been told over over the course of a year, year and a bit, year and a little bit more, and you know you could quite easily sort of like pay it off. Because you've also you've not only got the the story of like Marty coming up short in this match tonight with Aldous, and he sort of like has to go away for sort of like the majority of a year and then come back and then look to challenge him again. But it also feeds into the story of the fact that Marty has never won like a world championship in one of these top tier promotions. So I mean, there's there's the possibility of a payoff there, but as you say, with him being the booker of Ring of Honor, with him not really being there full time in NWA, I could understand, I could understand them not not putting the belt on him. I don't think it's worth it. No, I, 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 I just just as a serious note, I don't think it's got to a point now where Nick Aldis is so good with that title and so good as the top guy 
mm. it's going to take something pretty freaking special to knock him off. And we're not talking about someone who's popular because of a YouTube show. I, I'm not dissing on Mighty Skill for one little minute, but this villain character, this the, the build-up he got, especially in Ring of Honor, was... 50% at least, I'm convinced 50% uh, off the coattails of the Elite and off the Bullet Club. We're talking Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Adam Hangman Page. We're talking about them guys. I think he got that popular and he's got to where, sort of like Triple H, maybe he would have got there if, it, if Triple H didn't marry Steph. Maybe he would have got to there. We don't know, but he's there probably because of that and i could say the same with mighty school he's probably there because of how popular he was with the young books etc so is he important enough now on his own with this villain enterprises stable to take that title off someone like nick aldis who has held it for a bloody long time and the answer is no it's it, it's it's not even a question. He has not got enough momentum by himself. He hasn't generated it himself. He is. It, it's come from the young bucks. It's come from Kenny Omega. It's come from the elite. And and I think that's why he's not joined AEW. And I think he's gone the route he has. It's to try and generate his own momentum. And it's just way too early for him because mm. he's not got it. He's just not got it at the minute. He's not popular. He, he's popular. He's over. Don't get me wrong. But is he willing? Is he at the point where he's going to take a tie, the title of someone who's held it for over 500 days? No. Yeah. Just no. Mm-hmm. Absolutely not. Almost two years now, they call us all it. He's not. It, it's not going to be a big enough pop. It's not going to be a big enough payoff. And if he was to take it off him, it wouldn't be a long reign. Let's be honest. It wouldn't be a long reign. No. So there's no point in doing it. There's no Mm -hmm. point. Nobody benefits from it. Nobody benefits from that decision. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, I can see your point. I can see your point. Um, And yeah, that pretty much much wraps up the, the Crockett Cup. Uh, what did you guys think of the show as a whole? As I say, it was a it was a cool three and a half hours. Uh, I, I, I must say it was it was a very easy show to watch. Um, there was nothing to blow away unless you counted the Willie Mac Colt Cabana and then obviously the main event. Uh, all the other matches were very, were fine to an extent. Um, but as I say, it was a very easy show to watch and. Um, as I say, we've we've possibly got the we've got the possibility of a couple more NWA pay per views in the pipeline. Uh, but I definitely would like to uh, sample sample some more NWA. Uh, what do you guys uh, think of the show overall? Yeah, I mean, I thought it was a it was a decent show. You know, um, it was made by that main event. Um, you know, not, no disrespect to everything else that was on the card. Um, but I mean, there there were there were there were the matches that they were there, they were fine, and mm-hmm. um, you know they were stand out. And then that main event happened, and it went from being a well, that was a solid, if not spectacular, pay per view to being yeah, okay, I'll probably I'll watch that again. And oh wait, I've already watched it twice. So, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I, it was nice to see the Crockett Cup back in its glory. Um, I, 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 I like the concept of the, the tournament itself. I like the idea of it. Uh, it was fine. It was nice. It was good. It wasn't amazing. It, it was there. It was good. It was nice to see the Crockett Cup back and all that. Um, I think that's uh, again the, the the main event took it for me because it was treated like a big deal, 
Mm-hmm. And when you treat something like a big deal, it resonates with the crowd, it resonates with the people who are watching it, and you think, right, this is a big fucking deal, I've got to stay and watch this and give it me all and watch this. That's what you've got to do. Mm-hmm. And I think if they did that with the whole, maybe some of the, even, even if it's just the final of the Crockett Cup and did it with them, maybe it giving it a bit more off. I just think it could be, hopefully they do it better. <laughs> Next time, I just thought it could, it needed a bit more for me. Mm. It was fine. Uh, Coxie, your thoughts overall? Uh, yeah, overall, I think it was a decent show. I was, I was, I remember being hyped about it when I first heard it was coming back because I'm, I am quite a bit of a fan of tag team wrestling. Uh, of course, that that company up north doesn't really rate it. That's why teams are leaving. But uh, being a former being a former tag team wrestler myself, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's I kind of get why they had to go with like the the ROH sort of team up because obviously the NWA, the NWA roster at the time was lacking, and as you see through power, more and more people come into it, um, and they're probably still going to be using ROH going forward if they were doing the Coffee Cup this year. Uh, but then it'd be interesting to also see where they where they get where they would have gone with. Alderson's, the Alderson skill rematch, mm-hmm. uh, considering this one was as violent as it was. I don't know if you guys, if it was, if it was black and white again for you guys in the main, but mm. it, it, it it was at, it yeah. was at points what, after Alderson got bof- busted open. Yeah, mm. yeah. The the one I acquired, it wasn't. So it was uh, sort of it, take, it took me back to I would think back to sort of seeing clips and stuff when you see like when you see the Magnum TA matches and you see. Flair and Dusty and Harley Race and whoever else in these main events where it's I quit or a steel cage or whatever and they're, they're all just like pissing blood mm. like, so it sort of kind of t- took me back to that which I thought was like a good little nostalgic t- trip, I know there's people that sort of say you don't need blood in wrestling but sometimes it can help a feud or like continue a feud or whatever which I think helped with this bit mm. um, just listening to you guys talk about mag- like Nick Alderson's skill then sort of it had me throw together some quick fantasy booking <laughs> in my head, which was literally a case of like, I could, yeah, like, like you've all said, I can't see skill winning the belt. I, I can't, I couldn't see Aldis chasing for it, if anything. Mm. He's not, he's not a chaser, he's a defender. Um, and if anything, like from this show where it shows they've had, they brought in New Japan guys, they brought in CMLL, uh, they brought in Ring of Honor, like, have these almost territorial guys come in, or like cut different guys from different countries come in and challenge for the world the world title to give Nick Carlis that bit more establishment and credibility. Mm-hmm. And if you are if you are going to have like Marty Skill take it off him, have him like like pretty much go with the route of Aust- Austin Hart. He didn't tap out; he passed out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Leave it. Leave him lying in a pool of his own blood, unconscious from a chicken wing. Yeah. And then have him ch- have him chase for it, but like whoever I think there's not Daz said, have him get it back rather quickly and continue on another long reign until there's a, another credible threat comes along, like Thomas Latimer. Hmm. Not friends. It's strictly business sort of thing. Boom. Match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very true. Very, very true. Uh, Right, yeah, so that brings to an end our review of the Crockett Cup. And uh, next in the pipeline, we'll be uh, jumping back into the world of New Japan Pro Wrestling, where they made a trip for the very first time to do a live pay-per-view in England. Uh, I've just had a look at the matches here. Top three are very tasty. Uh, I'll give you... Give you the top three matches um, of what's to come. So we'll have a rematch from the G1 Supercard, uh, Zack Sabre and Hiroshi Tanahashi for the Rev Pro British Heavyweight title. Uh, we'll also get a chance to see Tomohiro Ishii properly for the first time as he defends the Never Openweight Championship against Kenta. And a mouth-watering main event for the IWGP World Championship with Kazuchika Okada defending against Minoru Suzuki. I can tell you already, I am so looking forward to reviewing this next show. I'm dribbling with excitement. (laughs) (laughs) 
she get your boys to mop it up. Bring me up another boy. <laughs> My wife's upstairs and she's probably hearing me shout this. <laughs> she's, she, she finds Dalton Castle very thick and creepy because of the boy thing, so God knows what she's thinking about me at the minute. <laughs> oh, well, she married me, stupid fucking idiot. Right, <laughs> Right, lady, right, gentlemen, um, before we go, uh, if you've got any plugs, go ahead and plug now. Um, as usual, if you've enjoyed hearing my voice, as much as I enjoy hearing my own voice, you can find me on the Gunpowder Treason No Plot Podcast, where I play Rogar, the Dragonborn Paladin Sorcerer. You can find us on all good podcast providers, and you can follow me on Twitter, at Treason No. And if you don't like storylines and you'd rather listen to me, you can follow me on Instagram <laughs> at... Oh, what is my Instagram? Hang on a minute. I changed it the other day. I changed it the other day. I'm not sure what I changed it. Uh, you can follow me at the Real Not Daz on Instagram, where I post videos hum- humiliating my wife. Or follow me on TikTok, TikTok at, at The Annoying Husband. Yes, that's right. Another <laughs> another character for me to portray. Um. Yes, I am the longest reigning uh, WrestleMania predictions champion ever in the history of podcasting. Yeah, that's me, Don. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you can hear yourself on the G1 Supercar, which just came out last week. Oh, God, yeah, go and watch that. Or go and listen <laughs> to it. In fact, watch it and listen to it. Do both. Get your face um... all up in it. <laughs> And of course, you can find the Lost Art of Podcasting on Facebook, on Twitter at Lost Art Podcast, or on Instagram at Lost Art of Podcast, and you can find us on all good podcast platforms. Uh, I'll chuck in a pod, a pod, plug myself. Um, I'm not really on Twitter too much, but if you want to come and debate the uh, anything, whether it be football, uh, American football, wrestling, whatever takes your fancy, if you want to come and debate it. Uh, Follow me on Twitter at Logden11. Um, so yeah, guys, not much else. Uh, not much else. Yes, left to say, except thank you very much for uh, for coming on and uh, and talking some NWA. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, having for having us. Oh, not a problem. Not a problem whatsoever. You're welcome back anytime. Um, so until next time, I have been Lewis Ogden. I've been Billy the Boy Bunkle. I've been the real not Darzant. I've been AXE. And we will see you next time for New Japan Royal Quest. <laughs>